Hello, everybody. You're listening to Friends of the Force. I'm your host, Sarah. And I'm your host, Brad. And on today's episode, we are having the long-awaited conversation about, drumroll please, thank you, Path of Vengeance by Kevin Scott, the end of phase two of the High Republic. Hooray! Sound Yay! We're back with another High Republic. New cabin book warrants air horn. Definitely. That's, I mean, absolutely. Um, so we're here. It is the end of phase two of the High Republic. We've made it. And we're ending off on another cabin book. Last time we read a cabin book was The Rising Storm. We're not including the audio dramas of the comics. We've also been doing those, but we're talking novel, novel. It was The Rising Storm, and that messed us up big time. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that Kevin has done it again. I feel he's messed up. done it again. <laughs> do you feel messed up after having read this book? I do. I do. I mean, Path of Vengeance itself, a title is not one that warrants a lot of joy in life. Uh, a lot of oh. fun, perhaps. Um, a lot of non vengeance. In fact, mm, mm-hmm. uh, it is pure vengeance. It is pure violence. It is right. pure chaos. Mm-hmm. Uh, emotions, fear. Uh, I'm scared. Mm. I'm scared. A little, a little scared. But also very yeah. happy that I could read more of Kevin Scott's Star Wars words because he gets it. He 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 just gets Star Wars. He 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 gets it. He gets it. And we'll be talking a lot of all the details of the things that shook us to our core and all the details that we were just um obsessed over. Uh lots of egg talk is about to happen. But before we get there, there was a bit of higher public news recently. So we want to talk about that for like two seconds. Worst kept secret in the High Republic is that Briaga lives. If he was dead, then you, I would two feet off the cliff. Goodbye. You know, like that would be, that would be, you're killing, you're killing the Jedi Padawan Wookiee. Like sick. That's sick. So he's not dead. Thank God. Uh, and we will see more of him in Tales of Light and Life, which comes out in book form on September 5th, but earlier at San Diego Comic-Con and apparently on audiobook very soon. So. um. That's going to be a time between in a couple weeks from now to September in order to uh, hear about this book and um, get it in our hands eventually some way, somehow. Yeah. To clarify, it is the ebook uh, that mm. is out on July 25th on Amazon. So if you want to read Tales of Light and Life 45 days early, and if you're not going to San Diego Comic-Con, uh, there's your chance to avoid spoilers and probably buy two different versions of the book because I personally want the hard copy. Mm. I have complicated feelings about it, but I will probably probably be buying the ebook if we don't receive uh, review copies because I want to know. I want to know what happens to Barriaga like immediately. And also, I, mean, I need Elzar Man back in my life. Like, come on. right? I mean, right. This is one but of my most say, anticipated books of the year. I would, I would I, say. Okay, I agree because we love an anthology here on the pod, um, and we're getting another one with, from a certain point of view. Return of the Jedi quite soon as well. So it's like a big time for anthologies. Um, also highly anticipated. <laughs> yeah, for real, for real. Um, of all the three, those three books, that's going to be probably the best one. I, I have a feeling. You think? You think? Yeah. We've had some yeah, good, hot take. some good stories in the past it's two. It's going to be so. a good one. It's going to be a good one. Return of the well, Jedi is full of glup shittos galore. So, you know what? You know? You're right. You're right. And also we have some people we're really excited about um, writing on that book. Uh, hopefully they so. will come on this podcast so hopefully many of you listeners authors, will hear our conversations authors, with them. please come on to our podcast we want to tell you how much we love your stories really so we have that going on we also have a, a cover reveal and official description for the eye of darkness uh by george mann which is the first adult book in phase three which holy shit is happening in just a couple of months 127 <laughs> days to be exact 127 days. You had that off the top of your head? Potentially. All right. All right. Well, the art for the uh, cover is by Grant <laughs> Griffin. And it's... It's... Speaking to us. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> let me just say. Let me just say. Uh, Elzar Man might not be the only one fucking in phase three. Because we got Martian Rowe, full man spread on the throne. And we know for a fact, it is a canon fact, that Martian Rowe fucks. 
Mm, so I'm you're saying. right. So I'm you're saying. right. And he also has some incredibly impressive biceps, which <laughs> speaks to me. So um, that is coming out on <laughs> the 14th of November. <laughs> Five minutes in and we're unhinged. <laughs> yeah, it's going really well. It's going really well. Um, <laughs> So things I think like we just want to like mention in there is like there's uh, an impenetrable barrier that like the Nile has set up. I have so many questions about that, but like I have to just wait 127 days and then we'll have answers. It's fine. Um, the nameless and other horrors. Okay. Okay. What um, else does Marcian Rowe have up that <laughs> bicep? Okay. Well, I guess we'll find out. Oh, yikes. Um, the Avar and Elzar are split up which is sad for the shippers because that means maybe less content, capital C content than we were hoping for. But, you know, it's okay. We'll live. We will live. We got temptation of the force on the horizon. And I think we're going to get, we're going to get plenty. Temptation. I don't know. Temptation is kind of a sexy word. So like fingers crossed, you know? Yeah. Not getting my hopes up, but I'm kind of getting my hopes up that Elzar man will once again lose his pants in phase three. And maybe (laughs) temptation of the force is the answer. Mm-mm. Yeah, I just we've, talk, we've talked happy, about this. I just want a happy ending for these characters. Um, yeah. really bad. And I know Star Wars is not about that, but like I really would like that. It'd be really nice if they wanted to do that for me, you know, for me. Um, we have Elzar and Belle and like a relationship there about how much, you know, they're going through and the losses they've experienced. We also have an occlusion zone. Like, so there's lots going on in this book. And I think I speak for both Rad and I when like, we're really excited to get back to phase three and our phase one characters um, because we love them. We love them a lot. Yeah. As much as I've loved phase two and getting to know all these characters back in time and you just can't be the nostalgia and the attachment that we've shared with those with those phase one characters. Um, and I, we've talked about this a little bit, I think is just, we've been through the ringer with those characters. Like we, we like share a trauma with them in a way of like the hyperspace disaster, the Valo fair, uh, Starlight beacon crashing into the ocean. Like we, we've been through it with them. We, we are bond. We are bonded for life. Right. By yeah. going through those trenches. Um, I, so it's hard to beat that emotional connection. Mm. Any way you slice it. So phase three is going to be great. I can't wait. Yeah, I'm I mm, just like Jungkook's new single, which will be out by the time that this podcast is out. Probably I live in fear of it. I live in fear mm. of phase three and Jungkook's new single because just because I'm already talking about BTS and we're like 10 minutes in. Um, Jungkook is just so powerful. You know, the, the phase one characters are just so powerful in my mind's eye. You know, they're they're just everything to me. So I'm afraid for what might happen to them. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's it for the news, I think. Did I miss anything? No, uh, I'm just so excited. I think the cover looks great. I love Grant Griffin doing more Star Wars art after having done some of George's previous novels like uh, Dark yeah. Legends and Myths and Fables. Mm-hmm. So it's just great having him on board. And uh, yeah, the Storm Wall. I want to know more about the Storm Wall. That's spooky. Feels spooky. Yeah. It's giving like literal eye of the storm, like hurricane in space type of stuff. Yeah, I, just an impenetrable barrier. Like I have so many questions about that. Like it's space. It's mm-hmm. the final frontier. These are the voyages as a starship. You like you know what I'm talking about? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but like seriously, I don't know how you build a wall in space. Uh, so that that'll be news to me. You know, we're just gonna have to throw logic out a window for a minute, and that's okay. We do that all the time with Star Wars, and that's fine. I, th- yeah. I live. It's so, okay. You know, Star Wars anyway. is silly. Star Wars is very silly, um, but we love it. We love it nonetheless. You know what's not silly, though, Brad? What's that? Reading. Oh. Reading is very serious. And <laughs> this is a book podcast. And it's also a podcast where we want more people to read. You're probably, you probably read if you have are listening to this podcast this transition started off well and it's just gone downhill we're not gonna worry you had to read you're really you're really driving today you're really driving the transitions the forward momentum of this podcast i'm i'm sitting here as a mere passenger aboard aboard this voyage and i'm 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 having a having a hell of a time with the transition i thought you're not often in the passenger seat here but like i just you know that driver gets the aux cord so (laughs) (laughs) so that's oh no she's about to play bts (laughs) Well, guess what i'm the one who inserts day. the audio i'm the one i'm the one who does it so i can just i can just nix it nix the Nixing. idea oh rip okay yeah. anyway well that does bring us to the bookstore of the week so we you know not only love to read but love to share bookstores uh that are independent that are um 
providing a service and a space for their communities. It's really important to me specifically, but it's, it's just important to the mission of the podcast. So today's bookstore of the episode is Left Bank Books. Left Bank Books is a bookstore out of St. Louis, Missouri, and they uh, opened in 1969 by a group of graduate students at Washington University uh, to be a place where you can find all kinds of literature. They're the oldest and largest independently owned full line bookstore in St. Louis. Um, and they seem really cool, to be honest with you. They produce over 300 events a year, which are free and open to the public. Um, and they've had, you know, presidents and local poets and everybody in between. They host a bunch of book clubs, um, including great novels of the 22nd century, read the resistance and the gay men's reading group. Um, so they have like lots of different audiences and, uh, topics that they talk about in their book clubs. And I think that's really awesome because they're engaging with their local community. Um, and they also are really like involved with their you know, community around St. Louis. And I think that that is awesome. Um, partnering with schools in the area and that sort of stuff. So yeah, you can find them at left-bank.com and you can order online for them, learn more about them and support their store that way. Uh, so I hope that wherever you are, whether you be in the St. Louis area or anywhere else in the U S or the world that you can find a bookstore to support if you are able to do so, um, because supporting your local bookstores brings, keeps money in that community. Um, it keeps people employed, uh, and helps large giant, 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 giant companies not get bigger. <laughs> so, um, that's my recommendation this week. Left bank books. Awesome. Thank you for listening. Yeah. And thank you for, for sharing. We, we love sharing a new independent bookstore every single book episode. It is, it is a, a great thing. And a, we love reading. We, we love, love reading. reading. In, case you haven't, in case you haven't figured that out yet. If you're a new listener. Did you, listeners, <laughs> did you guys know that I literally have a map of all the independent bookstores in the U.S. in my room? That's cool. I'm like serious about this. We're going to blaze our way through all those bookstores at some point. We should just have a never ending friend friendcation where we just bookstore hop. Oh, and we podcast at other books. Uh, all, all, we podcast oh. at the bookstores and then we're we going to, we're going to have it's like a, an author tour, but it's for us and nobody shows right. up. Right. And, and like, we're, <laughs> we're like sleeping in a minivan and, um, we, the, the minivan, the back of the minivan is just full of books because we feel obligated to buy something in every bookstore. And that license plate will be the letter L dash Z A R. I'm the driver. This is my car. We're not kidding. <laughs> the specialized license plate. Um, the specialized the the specialized license plate would be like F O T F for E V A. <laughs> Friends of the Forest forever. <laughs> oh my God! Turn the car around. Go return it to Hertz. <laughs> We're done. We're, not renting we're done a car. Here. We're using our. We're using all of the salary that you and I get from oh, this to we're purchase using that credit vehicle. <laughs> We're racking up the credit card debt. I see. Okay, that's right. That's right. So if we don't have a busy enough year ahead of us, but let's 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 buy an RV as well as some books from this independent bookstore because that's awesome. So yeah, uh, books, books. Speaking of a book, we got a book. We're gonna talk talk about about one. Yeah. Uh, If you haven't read Path of Vengeance, this is your first and final warning. Uh, We will be going full spoilers ahead, so we're gonna talk all of the nooks and crannies of this book: character development, theme. Shocking moments, shocking deaths, you name it. It's going to be covered here. Egg talk. Egg talk, most importantly. If you thought egg talk was fun before, buckle in your seatbelt. Because it's, a, it's probably the, the most egg of any talk that we'll have done on this podcast. That being said, here we go. Sarah, <laughs> yeah. introduce us to our book here. Yeah, Brad took over the transition as if you couldn't tell. He was like, mm, you really flopped on the other one. So I'm just going to get back in the driver's seat of the car. We're doing a driver swap. And he said, Taylor Swift is on the radio. Um, yeah, you were, you were walking off the cliff towards your flop era. And I pulled you back by the collar. <laughs> That's right. You're still you're still walking straight. So I'm gonna have to keep real, uh, reeling you in every now and then. Yeah, you know, Okay. <laughs> great, great, great. Anyway, our path, our, our book of the day. <laughs> <laughs> the path that we are on is the one of vengeance. Uh, and um, I feel like we should start with our overall thoughts, which we probably hinted at up at the top because we love Kevin Scott. It is no surprise to anyone that we both, right, loved this book, really enjoyed this book. Um, and I think for me, like what works so well about Kevin's writing is I think he really gets the characters that he's writing. 
and he really um brings us on a journey with them he's never i feel like he's never talking down to us as the reader and he's always taking us on a ride like i always feel like i am getting in the roller coaster whenever i read a cabin book uh and this was no different because at the end of this book I will spoil it right here. The big reveal of, oh, if it's a boy, we'll name it this. And if it's a girl, we'll name it Mari. And I was like, what the fuck? And I live at home. Okay. So like there are my family around and my fa- my parents were like, Sarah, are you okay? Are you, are you good? And I was like, this, bu- this book, guys, this book, it's a big revelation, big revelation. And they were like, all right. And I was like, I'm freaking out. So he does it again. He does it again. I'll probably be thinking about my out loud exclamation of shock (laughs) going forward. Yeah. Kevin always knows how to deliver, especially in the final act. Like right when you think the story might slow down or come to an ending point, he ramps it back up back to 11. Uh, He did that in the rising storm. He does it in this, but I, I just love his writing. I, I'm, I forget which books he's writing in phase three. I know he'll be writing, I think, like one more, possibly two more, maybe maybe an unannounced audiobook original here and there. But yeah, I would say ultimately this turned out to be one of my favorite books of phase two uh, and, and following the trend that I think the young adult for me had been my favorite of phase two. I think if you had very limited time and, and limited resources and you could only choose one line to follow in phase two, I would recommend the young adult. I think it is probably going to tell the most essential story of uh, phase two in order to inform phase three, because it is so leveler heavy. It's about force cults. You got the Jedi. Um, You got all sorts of stuff baked in these two books. It makes a really, really good duology. And I think having like Tessa and Justina and Kevin, like that's just a, a powerhouse, a powerhouse of writers to offer some stories. Not that, you know, other books in the phase aren't, but um, I think these are just like the most quintessential of some of the things that we love the most about the High Republic, which is that like that tragedy, the pain, but also the action and the character uh, deep dives and uh, some of the themes that we deal with as we talk about the Jedi and are the Jedi right? Are the Jedi righteous? What's their legacy? Are they failing? Right. Failing like hubris It has all that in these books, especially Path of Vengeance. Right. And I think what's so interesting to me about especially the YA novels in phase two is that like, I don't really, and correct me if I'm wrong, listener, um, but I don't ever really think we've really tackled the topic of like religion in, in this sort of way in Star Wars. Like, you know, we know the Jedi are a sort of religious organization and they follow the force, et cetera, et cetera. And then we know in rogue one, we get the guardians of the wills and occasionally we'll get like a different flavor of the force here and there, like legends of Luke Skywalker with the tide. But like, we don't really dive into all the complexities of that and the goods and the bads. And it's, it's pretty crazy to me that like these two books are about religious cults. (laughs) Mm -hmm. in a very direct and um kind of unflinching way uh these books don't go well for people who aren't at least you know like in path of deceit like kevin is dead by the end of that book you know like it doesn't go well for our heroes and we see the religious cult winning and here you know they have wins and they have losses but you see their their structure and their plans become more extreme over the course of the book. And it's really uh, interesting that like Star Wars has tackled this topic in this way to me. And um, yeah, I just think it brings another layer to Star Wars that we haven't quite explored in this way before, which I like. And what I really loved about this book was that you also get a little bit of the battle of Jeddah, you know, coming off right, of the, right. that big moment for the path where I think that radicalization can uh, further even more because the, of the confrontation on Jetta and the way that the uh, convocation of the force is perceived and the Jedi's involvement with the peace talks and a lot of the galaxy blames the Jedi for what, re- what went wrong uh, and also the uncertainty around the path's involvement. So I think those couple of factors just really accelerate their, their, uh, their propaganda efforts to uh, paint the Jedi in a certain way and also like incite violence. And that's something that um, a character like Yana sort of recognizes and tries to avoid 
and a mm-hmm. character like Marta who falls into that a little bit, but sort of comes out on the other end a little more enlightened, but still with a mission uh, to to protect the galaxy from what she perceives as a threat and uh, as a, you know, the torturers of the force as she thinks the Jedi are. But yeah, I, I thought I thought the book just covered so much ground and it's a chunky one. It's like 500 pages. And I, I love a chunky higher public book, especially one written by Kevin, because, you know, those those pages are like every single thing in those pages like matters and and has some sort of like meaning and detail. And um, again, not that others don't. It's just like his specific style of writing, like really clicks with me on a certain level. And I was I was happy to see how thick the book was when I got it. I was like, yes, we're in I was for panicking. Ride. <laughs> I was panicking because I had said, oh, my God, I have to read this. Guys, <sighs> for you, listener, listener, I need you to know that one night I was on the treadmill uh, for 90 minutes and I read like 150 pages in this book in one go on the treadmill. Huge deal for me, guys. Please applaud. Yay. Thank you so much for your applaud. applaud. Congratulations. I really appreciate that. Because, um, you know, it's hard for me to put eyeballs to page these days. Most of the time I just listen on my, my ears. But that's, you know, that's, that's how good this book is. I was able to put my eyeballs to page for 90 minutes. So now you're putting your eyeballs to me for 90 plus minutes as we talk about the book, which regrettably so is much more difficult. Actually, we could turn cameras off if you want. We re- if you really want to. Okay. She's actually turning her camera off. So it is me oh, I, now I just, talking. Oh, that's back. I, I just okay. muted myself instead. So, you know, there we okay. go. Now, oh, now. And she's gone now. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I, I, I would like to say as much as I did love phase two, I'm excited to return to our phase one characters. But I think at the end of the day, phase two was a great installment in the High Republic uh, tapestry. And I think Path of Vengeance especially put the cake topper on a lot of different things uh, and made a lot of connections between phase one and phase two and uh, is an origin story of sorts with how the Nile come about and, and the leveler and the origins of the leveler and the nameless. And uh, I, I'm like so excited to see like how all of that knowledge of phase two is synthesized in phase three and who becomes a key player. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in the coming months. Like we keep joking, like so-and-so is the key to all of this. I think that'll be a large focus of our phase three preview episode. It's oh, like, definitely. Who are, who are the people that are the key to all of this? Like I can probably rattle off a couple of names and we'll talk about some of them, but uh, I Marta think that. Marta Rowe. Yeah, Marta Rowe, uh, Aslan Rell. I mean, there's, there's a couple, there's a couple in there. Yeah, and yeah, I think, yeah. I think uh, that's exciting. It's like, we still come out of this phase not feeling like, what was the point? I come out of mm. it being like great story. We got what we needed. Love some of the characters along the way and let's move forward now. So. Right. 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 Yeah. I feel like the phase two stories overall may not stick with me as much as phase ones have, but I do feel like we've learned a lot over the past, however many books, six books that will propel us into phase three in a way that is valuable. And like, I really have enjoyed some of these characters, Marta and Yana, especially they've been really interesting to follow. So, um, yeah, all, all, all good at the end of the day, no time is wasted time in the higher public. Well, you mentioned Marta and Yana. Let's start there. Cause I think they are the, the focal point of the book perhaps. And we mentioned the connective tissue, the Nile, the formation of the Nile from the path of the open hand to the path of the closed fist to the Nile right? The symbol changes. We've seen, we've seen, uh, the waves was the starting point in path of deceit. Mm. Uh, that book ends with the vertical lines being formed because they're going to be more aggressive, uh, more tactical in their ways. And by the end of this book, Marta is using whatever paint that she has left on the gaze electric. And she is putting three jagged lines in the shape of a thunderbolt or a lightning bolt on her head. The Nile ride the storm. Shocking. Yeah. How did yeah. you feel about that? Like when you've when, like that moment of like realization of, oh, OK, like sh- that's the path she's going to carve, like literally the path, you yeah, know, the I Nile. Mean, ultimately, like that felt like the place we were going to go from the very beginning is like, oh, it's not going to be Yana, uh, certainly. So it's going to be Marta that we know that we know that we have a row in phase one and he's pretty bad. And we know that we have the gaze electric and we know that we have Marta and Yana 
And, you know, it's not going to be Yana because she doesn't feel the same way about the path as it is, as, as Marta does. And so is Marta. And uh, whew, that hurt at the end. It, it was, it's like you kind of know where it's headed. You know that the choice that somebody, it's, it's, it's very Hades down of them, you know, um, where they literally say it's a sad song and we're going to sing it anyway. And like, it's a sad song, but we'll sing it again, even though we know how it ends. And it's really that vibe, but um, within the High Republic, because, you know, I think it was pretty easy to foreshadow and understand that, like, it's going to be Marta. But then watching it happen in the book and knowing the path that they're about to go down, um, the path <laughs> um, <laughs> is... Is, is, it's a bummer. It's a bummer because especially when we get that moment where Marta and Yana see eye to eye and are there to save each other and like still love each other. And, but they, but they really don't see eye to eye at the end of the day. Like it's, it's hard. It's hard to say, okay, I think you're wrong and I know you're wrong, but I've got to let you go. It's interesting. It's complicated. Yana is pretty de-radicalized in this book in many ways. Cause she was already disillusioned with the mother but she goes to great lengths to save the Herald because it's it's Kor's dad and and tries to save Kor's mom, I believe, but is unsuccessful there. And um, she, she saves the Littles. I believe so. I think so. Because she kills the Herald. Or the Herald yeah. dies at one point. The Herald is dead. Uh, but like she tries to get her out, but I don't know where if that ends up. I believe that was just sort of left, left off. Mm. I believe I might be wrong on that. I don't personally remember. It doesn't really matter too much for the purposes of this conversation, but, um, right. I think like Yana taking that separate path and also stealing another half of the, the rod as well. Right. Like speaking of people who are the key to all of this, like if it weren't for Yana Rowe and her sort of seeing, seeing what was happening with the path and trying to get away from it and, and carve her own journey. Um, if not for her, the, the galaxy would have been even in more danger with, with a fully formed rod to control the nameless. Cause Marta, right. Marta is lacking that power at this point. Um, but also just generally it's, it's so sad to see, you know, for so long, Yana wanted to protect Marta because she knew Marta had a good heart and Marta was somebody who saw the, the beauty in the galaxy. And I've compared her to Dolores a lot from Westworld. And Dolores is a character in Westworld who, you know, starts very uh, like, you know, looking at the world through rose tinted glasses because she is a, you know, she is a bot and uh, she becomes radicalized and she she wants to create a new world. And I think that's definitely Marta's. Uh, mission by the end of this is 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 that good heart that she had has definitely turned sour with the things that she's been through uh and it says here no one would tell her no ever again for the first time in her life she was truly free and if anyone tried to tell her otherwise well they would reap a whirl whirlwind whirlwind of their own <laughs> can't say that word um but that's just like such a that's like such the mentality that martian has too right like martian's like the republic's not going to tell me what to do they're not going to impede on my life. I, I am going to have my own freedom and I'm going to destroy the galaxy so I can have it. Like this is not as much about like holding power. It's about holding freedom for Martian row. Likewise, that's, that's where Marta ends up is she's like, I, I am, I am the, the driver in my own destiny. Like I, I'm right. in the driver's seat, not the passenger seat. Yeah. She's like, I've got the ox court now. <laughs> i'm the captain uh, now of, it's funny my, it's funny that i keep saying the ox cord even though like you know phones don't have <laughs> headphone jacks anymore it's fine um but uh yeah she she definitely has like her alphabet in wicked moment where she's like and i'm wicked um you know after all the <laughs> things that the alphabet says this she has a whole, and then she starts singing through and through the night cannot succeed the arrow saving you i promise no get evil i intend to do again anyway so it's uh it's, it's it's great it's great um but marta has that moment too where it's like you know she was pure-hearted in the beginning and then she fell into this fell into this uh this cult and really took to their belonging took to their ideals because she wanted a sense of belonging um and yana was trying to yana knowing that this was messy really tried to keep her grounded but quite couldn't quite do it um and you know not that it was her responsibility to but you know it it's a complicated, complicated situation. Very sad for Marta. 
And it's even more complicated because she makes a choice to save the Jedi in this book. And I think it mm. sort of stems from whatever leftover guilt she has from what happened to Kevmo. And, and, and boy, she does wants she have to, some guilt still. Yeah. <laughs> she wants to break that cycle quite a bit. But also when she gives her very impassioned speech where she creates the path of the closed fist, you know, she says it's going to be the price of not an open hand anymore. She talks about the Jedi and how if they're left unchecked, their evil will tear through the galaxy like wildfire. Like she's still Ooh. very anti-Jedi by the end of this, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and she recognizes that the, the bad that they can do. But she it's interesting. She makes that choice to save Maddie and Olivia uh, by fighting against the mother. It's kind of like the enemy and my enemy is my friend, you know. Right. So that's that's sort of the vibe I was getting from from Marta. That definitely that feels like that moment and you know the bit of the guilt and the enemy of the enemy is my friend and how do we all survive in this moment and it's well it's like okay well I do I fight you or do I not um mm -hmm. and maybe we'll just all just this once we will all live um let you mentioned her closed fist speech and I I want to talk about that a little bit because you know reading our adult novels cataclysm specifically i was like where did this closed fist idea come from you know i never really got an inkling of that um you know in earlier books so it feels like it came out of nowhere why did the organization change hands uh or it had come up with something different and to learn that it was marta who instigated this change and that she kind of had this rousing speech that was kind of terrifying um is is uh interesting to me you know something that i wish we had gotten more of i know that the focus in the adult novels is not the perspective of the path or of the yeah of the path um but i wish we had gotten that in the adult books because i was like a little confused about how we had gone from a to b so quickly uh and this gives a lot of context to that in a way that i felt was really valuable and also really frustrating <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that wasn't a problem we ran into as much in phase one where it felt like, oh, there is really some essential information in another book. Because I feel like every book did a pretty fair job of telling you what you needed to know to understand like why this thing existed or why this thing was the way it was. And and that, that was definitely one in Cataclysm that I just couldn't really connect the dots. Mm -hmm. of like, why, why is Marta Rowe all of a sudden? And it's like, you shouldn't necessarily have to read Path of Vengeance to understand that. So I think a, a little bit more context there would have been good. Um, but I was happy to finally receive it because I think it was a very powerful speech, a powerful moment for Marta Rowe. Um, and also like usurping the mother in a way from, from oh, yeah. where she is the guide in this book. And now she's sort of like usurping the mother and the power and like people are looking to Marta Rowe and not the mother. And the mother recognizes that and is like, I know I told you no a lot, but I'm going to I'm going to tell you yes now because I want to be your bestie. Can we be besties and rule the galaxy yeah. together? Yeah. And Marta doesn't forget later on. She's like, I didn't forget. Trust me. The way that um, the Herald also does that where he's like, oh, opportunity right. to do that. And, and Yana is like this motherfucker. He, I know exactly what he's doing. Like, and he, she's so mad about it, and rightfully so. Um, but it's interesting how the people in a power and like there, there became like a slight power vacuum, which Marta filled, and then, you know, they also were like rushed to the top. How can we? How can we get back into a space where we can have influence and power? So it was really interesting to watch that unfold, and then like the power play between the mother and Marta and the ways that they, the ways that they were asking for the rods back and forth, back and forth, uh, really interesting to me. And, and when they would be willing to give them up specifically the mother, uh, and when they would not. Um, so I, you know, clearly, clearly, you know, the mother didn't want to lose that leveler. Yeah. It goes back to Palpatine saying all those who have power fear to lose it. And well, uh, that's it makes me, true. yeah, and it makes me think of George and he, how he describes the force, you know, being like a good force and a bad force and, and the Jedi sort of represent that compassion. And that's what the, the light side is designed around. Um, and then like the dark side is all about greed and, and owning things and um, not being able to let go of things and thinking about yourself like that, that those are the two sides of that coin. And 
it's just so easy for the Herald and, and the mother to just be like, I'm going to hold on to this as long as I can because I'm greedy. Like the four, like, and it's so interesting because the path talks about the Jedi poisoning the force, but the, the path is sort of representing that dark side, that, that greed and, and that desire to accumulate um, for themselves whether or not they they realize it and whether or not they're actually the ones poisoning the galaxy and not the jedi which we'll talk about a little bit as well in egg talk but it's uh yeah not great not, not great. great no um can we talk a little bit about how the leveler is eating the mother and how like and you're talking about you know the force and who's poisoning the force and it seems like the the leveler as an agent of the force is harming the mother by like feeding on her. Oh yeah. Like how her arm is turned to, to stone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's again, we've, we've, we've made the comparison to the one ring before, right? It's like the one right, ring right. poisons and it goes again, we're talking about power. So that makes sense to, to bring up With here. Great power comes great responsibility. You either yeah. live a hero or you either die a hero or see yourself live long enough to become the villain. You know, it's, it's interesting that she's like willing to hold on to power and literally crumble quite literally crumble in the process um there's no way out like once you've started turn to stone so like i don't know what sort of outcome she was really desiring for herself but like didn't work out for her in the end it's so interesting too because we think of the leveler as as representing fear we know fear is the path the dark side Mm. and yoda says you know once you start down the dark path forever it dominates your destiny right it's like well once you turn to stone you can't unturn from stuff right yeah if somebody tries to poke you you literally crumble into dusty dust right so like quite literally fear once you once you fear and for the mother it's like she fears to lose power i guess Mm. from a certain point of view she experiences fear um and the leveler feeds off of that that's why it feeds off of her that's what she offers to it is that fear uh and it sustains itself it grows itself from that as well as the fear of the Jedi and, and the force itself and, and consuming the force. So I thought it was, I thought it was really fascinating that the book also addressed why sunshine Dobbs felt the way he did around the mother and the yeah. fact that the mother is actually a force sensitive user and she's really manipulating public perception of her in order to hold on to that power, not only having this weapon, but like using the force. Mm -hmm. and she talks about the force and the jedi using it it's like you're doing the exact same thing you know like you are the one that's poisoning the well not the jedi right um it's really interesting when your cult leader is also literally somebody who can do magic a little scary too yeah yeah who can literally do mind control um yeah yeah i thought that reveal was actually really compelling because i remember reading the earlier books and going like why is sunshine like this like why is he so why is he so in puppy love with her you know why does he follow her around they don't seem like a like a pair um it's because they're not because she's a terrible person she's a gaslighter plain and simple she just gaslights sunshine dobbs all of phase two you gotta feel bad for sunshine dobbs because he fell for it like like a fool um but also he's kind of the worst so i don't really feel too bad for him i i love the moment when yana kicked him in the ass because he's like oh it could be a new beginning and she's like, or an ending. And she like kicks him into a room and shuts the door on him. <laughs> she's like, I've had enough I of you. I won't lie to you. I was, a, I was a little surprised that <laughs> she didn't end up going with him. Or he didn't, like, they didn't end up going with each other. I was a little surprised. But then I was like, nah, he's a shit. That's fine. Like, <laughs> Also, like, Yana's just had enough bullshit. <laughs> which, right. Like, pre- Yana's not preach. here. Nana's not here for anybody's nonsense anymore. Like, she's yeah. like, I'm, I'm, I'm too old and I've seen too much. And I also want to live. So uh, we talk yeah. about like she- judge, jury, executioner. Like Yana is the find out deliverer for those who fuck around. Yeah, for those who fuck around, <laughs> find out deliverer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. yeah so I, there's so many like um, interesting things that find like illuminated things uh, from the series so far. And that's definitely, those are definitely a couple of them. Well, and uh, I guess we can talk about. Speaking of sisters, Yana, well, I guess Yana and Marta are uh, cousins, but speaking of family, Alicia is the sister of Olivia Zevron, who is a Jedi, and we find that out, which I don't know where I learned this. Haven't we known this for a while? Wikipedia, no, no, no. We, we read it on Wikipedia. 
No, because I, I know when you read it and accidentally spoiled it for yourself, but we've known Alicia's last name from somewhere a while back, like even back in the fall. Mm. And I, I, I remember I people know. speculating, people were speculating when the uh, Cavins comic came out and there was a variant cover featuring Olivia on it. I feel like we've known that they were sisters for a while. Like I knew I that going into this book. I just, yeah, I just couldn't remember, but I thought the, the premise was interesting. You know, like two sisters, the Jedi takes one of them, the, leaves the other behind. And it's like the mother sits with that for her whole life of being like, I wasn't enough. People looked past me. I was left basically to fend for myself and look what I can do now. Look what, look at the path of vengeance that I can blaze against the Jedi. Like, that's why the book is called that, I think, in some ways. Like a logistical question. This is not important in the grand scope of things, but just something I'm thinking about. We seem to get a lot of different characters throughout Star Wars timelines and things. Talk about life before the Jedi um, in one way or another, right? Like, oh, I don't really have a memory of it. Um, or I do have a memory of it and I miss home or um, these sorts of things, right? It's interesting to me because it's how are people holding these sort of grudges when they were taken as babies? You know, I don't know. Like, I like because we know like Ahsoka based on Tales of the Jedi was taken like a baby baby um, to the Jedi. So I, I, that's just like a logistical thing that I'm curious about because we know that Anakin was old. But we know that like Ahsoka was very young. Mm-hmm. when when does this happen and why would the jedi reject somebody when they're like force user jedi that's just like always how it's been i don't know i've been thinking thoughts and they don't have any conclusions at this point i would imagine they have some memory of it and that's established a little bit in Kevin's comic because i remember when the mother is mentioned in front of olivia she has like a flashback to her as a baby playing with her sister like very that's like one or two panels but I, I mean, for, for the mother, for Alicia, I feel like even at such a young age, I would imagine there was some impression that her sister left on her, right? So it's easier for the mother to sit with that and dwell on it, whereas Olivia gets, quote unquote, indoctrinated into the Jedi, and it's very easy for her to forget the, the mother and her sister and her former life, whereas that's where Alicia was left. So she's like, she's the one that has to deal with that reality. And sure. Olivia lives this life as a Jedi and the Jedi want her to forget, like actively repress those memories in order to do her duty to the galaxy without attachment and to be the beacon of light in the name of selflessness, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Cause like imagine being the mother and you have a great relationship with your sister and you and your sister are both talented and you can do these things with your mind and you can make objects move. And then along, along come these Jedi and they take your sister away. And you're like, well, why, why would you take her and not me? Like we, but if you're four, we know what it was like as a kid to feel, well, again, like being a, being a kid, like kids are so impressionable. So it would be very easy for something like that to bury itself in, in her conscious or subconscious and I guess, yeah, have that sort of, have that sort of buried there the rest of her life that, that, that grudge, uh, and that, that feeling of like not being adequate enough. Right. Which is why she needs to go after a weapon that is so powerful because like, well, you think I'm not enough? Why don't I get the one thing that can destroy the Jedi entirely? Yeah. Now let's see how enough I am then. I guess speaking of memories though, and, and maybe flashes to our past, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention that we can't forget to mention are the ghosts that our characters are seeing throughout this book. Yana and Marta are both seeing Kevmo and Kor, uh, yep. the ghosts of them, and they are buried in their mind, trying to make them feel terrible about themselves, pointing out their pointing out their flaws, telling them they can't be enough, and that's gotta suck. But there there is the like fact established in this book that the ever any ever any do see ghosts of quote those they've slaughtered, and I think that's so interesting because. When you think of slaughter, like those they've slaughtered, that's like the actual act of killing. Right. And Marta and Yana are two characters that don't necessarily directly kill those people. Mm. But it's like the actions that they take that affect the circumstances around them maybe have led to those deaths. What do you, what do you think of that? Like the Everenia are really supposed to see 
those they've slaughtered. Whereas on the other side of the coin, you have Martian who kills his dad. Yeah. Who actually kills his dad, right? And Martian mm-hmm. sees the ghost of Asgard row constantly in, in present day. But what, what did you make of, of, of them seeing these ghosts? I don't know if I have any like really settled thoughts about this. I thought this was really an interesting point because they come and they go. They're there for a lot of the story and then they disappear. They stop communicating with them. But whether that communication was actually a fragment of them or Marta and Yana's subconscious telling them things, I don't know. Um, so I don't know how I, I like feel about it but i i found it to be like a really compelling part of the story because it keeps these characters around in a way that pushes our main characters um and i thought that that like story-wise that was really interesting but it also tells you like they both feel a certain amount of guilt and loss and sadness and um emptiness in certain ways without them and i don't know i don't know I just think it's interesting that the Evereni seem to have this uh, issue. And I will call it an issue in this case because they seem to nag our characters, uh, the presence of the ghosts. Yeah, real, not real. That is a interesting question to pose. But even regardless, like the emotions that they feel from it are very real, right? Like right, the, absolutely. The, insecure, the insecurity and... Um, the anger towards the ghosts that won't go away. And that's like something Martian has to deal with as well. He's very angry to see his father um, all the time haunting him, telling him why he can't be enough to lead the, the Nile. Um, I think the Ever- Evereni just in general, maybe they just carry a lot of guilt very easily um, based on the things that their people have had to experience uh, throughout the, throughout the galaxy, you know, like maybe it's a generational sort of trauma and that's why they, that's why they see those ghosts. A certain amount of guilt and perhaps a certain amount of resentment too, because of the way that they're outcast by others mm-hmm. and seen by the world as these like sort of savage, brutal people, um, not trustworthy. They're othered in a lot of ways. And so it seems like they perhaps internalize that in other ways that manifest. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. No, I think you're I think you're totally on to something there. It's uh embedded at a deep psychological level for for Yana and for um Marta and Martian. So mm. I thought that was really fascinating though. And also like the parallel of Marta wielding Kevmo's saber. We know Martian wields loading great storms, lightsaber. Right. So there there is something about a deeply troubled and <laughs> potentially mentally unstable Evreni. <laughs> Carrying a Jedi lightsaber uh, and wreaking havoc with it. <laughs> of course. Oh my gosh. I love it when Star Wars is that. <laughs> right, right, right. It was pretty cool. The image of, of uh, Marta holding that saber, that was very, very fascinating. And I know at one point, too, she has some trouble with it or it breaks. Yeah. Um, and I know it's also like described as crackling, which made me think of uh, Kylo Ren, like the way that his saber crackles because it's sort of a uh, a commentary on his mental state and the way that he is sort of torn as a person between the light and the dark mm. so maybe the fact that kevmo saber is now crackling is 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 symbolic of what marta is feeling internally of like the struggle between uh her family yana and like the path that she wants to blaze forward as as part of like the closed fist you know um, and, and also the guilt that she carries, like that good heart and that good heart turned sour within her, you know, there's layers. There are layers. It's like an onion. It's a high Republic onion. Duh. High Republic onion. <laughs> but you know, the oh. biggest high Republic onion of all. Let's hear it, Brad. It's actually not an onion. It's an egg. <laughs> <gasps> Dang. Are we there? Are we there? I suppose so. All right, we know what came first, the egg or the egg talk. I'm happy to report it was the egg talk. <laughs> All right, let's talk about it. We can be like a, a, a Rhett and Link. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Good mythical morning. Um, anyway, egg talk. Uh, this one's a doozy, guys. I don't even know where was- to start. <laughs> I don't even know either. Um, can we start, let, you know, mm, let's start with Planet X. Can we start with Planet X? Yeah. Planet X is a place. 
that we have heard quite a lot about in various things. We know that uh, Nath, right? No. Uh, what's the dad's name? Oh, da- it's Spence and Das, right? Yes. Um, Nath, where Nath Tencent. Okay, I got it figured out. Uh, Spence and Das Lefbrook, uh, found themselves on Planet X with Sunshine Dobbs, and then their ship crashed, and then they ended up getting off Planet X. And then they're trying to find their way back at Planet X. At least Das is in the hyperspace chase. We don't quite get to Planet X. The Planet X was the friends we made along the way. Now we go back to Planet X. And it's it's a it's a place. It's a place that feels, you know, like if we, you know, we call these certain places in the galaxy force nexus of next next I don't know what the plural of nexus is. Um force nexus places. That's what we're gonna go with. And this really seems like to be the center force nexus of force nexus playlists places because it's not like a place that functions normally at all the force nexus to rule them all the one right (laughs) exactly the pinnacle god tier force nexus this planet is bananas i mean we've seen it before too we've seen it in eye of the storm by charles soul we saw it in the comic and the way that the colors and yeah it looks just trippy as hell yeah it's not natural at all in any sense of the word. It is one of those places that I was trying to think of. Um, I was trying to think of like things that it reminded me of because it seemed like the trees were regenerating and the force was actively through like the veil trying to keep them out. Um, and that it it like had a certain stake in keeping the eggs there and keeping the beings in the dark and in the the caves and things and it didn't work out for them so well but it was trying and it reminded me a lot of annihilation the book and or the movie either is fine in this case as it was like science fiction e adapting on its own the in this one it's called area x so planet x area x they're not all that much different um and that people get lost there you know people expeditions go to area x and they don't come back um and that it has like a it has a it has a uh, effect on their mental well-being yeah wow now i'm rereading the synopsis for annihilation i read the book and saw the movie i'm both very messed up and i really got those vibes when i was on planet x um because we we're in the caves and like the creatures are coming after them, the protector and the, um, I forget what the other one is called. Uh, but very spooky, very spooky vibes for a place that feels so spooky. It's presented as a utopia of sorts. Like you're saying it has these properties where it heals. Mm -hmm. It creates life with the trees, um, healing in terms of like the, the injuries that our, our characters experience going through the veil um, heightened force sensitivity you know shape suddenly knows how to fix the ship bokana knows which fruit to pick and how to navigate the tunnels etc right and right that is so fascinating i think for me the most interesting thing was the veil itself mm. uh it's really it's really funny because in, uh just a little quick side tangent destiny 2 there is this thing called the veil in destiny that is very important and uh we don't know much about the veil and we're continuing to learn about it um it's the joke is like nobody knows what the veil is and so one of the characters is like what's the veil and they're like it's impossible to know and i was like yep that's just it just seems like when you have a thing in a science fiction fantasy story you just name it the veil and it's fine and it sounds cool you're like it's a thing it's a thing and it's the veil you don't need to know much about it yeah and it really will connect you from one place to another but you have to get through it first and that's a treacherous sort of situation exactly that's that's like definitely the vibe of this book too like the veil is like actively pushing back Um, i was thinking of it as a like an immune system almost like because it described these blobs that were coming at the ships and i thought of like white blood cells like attacking a virus uh in your body you were mrs frizzle miss frizzle on the magic school bus oh, on like man. the in the in the yeah in the body episodes oh my god yeah okay that's I mean, what the veil I, is i'm like, picking up like, what you're putting down yeah right right, right. <laughs> but only not only that like keeping people out but trying to leave expanding and getting bigger to like prevent them from even leaving it's like okay well now you're here 
what happens on Planet X stays on Planet X. So we need you to come back and we're not going to let you leave. Well, I think it's also feeling really threatened by the fact or feeling really alarmed by the fact that, you know, eggs are leaving. It definitely knows, you know, the creatures yeah. knew and the planet knows that it's trying to disrupt the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And, um, Brad, big question for you. Is this, is this part of me? Where are the S's in my speech? Is this the sin done to the nameless? Oh boy. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, are we, are we, are we gonna, we're gonna get into that now, huh? I mean, we, that, that, Brad, that is the crux of egg talk for us. That is, yeah. egg, that is egg talk. Egg, what is egg talk? Colon. When it, the sun, this is send on the nameless and the Jedi, yeah, yeah, yeah. the time is splitting behind you. You know yeah, probably yeah. better than I. Okay. So, so <laughs> let's, uh, we're going to start a little context again. Cause again, we, we might, maybe we picked up some new listeners who haven't experienced egg talk. Let, let's, let's, let's educate you a little bit. Welcome to Egg Talk. You're in the club, bestie. Rewind the 2019 Master and Apprentice by Claudia Gray is out on bookshelves. So and good. it features a prophecy that is, quote, as follows. Only through the sacrifice of many Jedi will the Order cleanse the sin done to the nameless. The danger of the past is not past, but sleeps in an egg. When the egg cracks, it will threaten the galaxy entire. When the force itself sickens, past and future must split and combine. A chosen one shall come born of no father and through him will ultimate balance in the force be restored. So you might think originally in 2019 is like, oh, chosen one is Anakin. He brings balance to Mm -hmm. the force. The sin done to the nameless is order 66. The nameless being the clones because they are numbered. They are not people uh, according to Palpatine. So. But everyone was like, what the heck is like, what, what, what about egg? What, what does an egg have to do with the clone trooper? Are they eating eggs for breakfast? Right. What's going on? I mean, that's a, that's part of a healthy balanced diet, but like, you know, we don't know. Yeah. So it was like a bit of a mystery of like, okay, we have this like very clear, like (laughs) we have this very clear, like uh, a start and finish to this, but like, what's the middle part? And I think as we've read the high Republic, like, yes, the chosen one prophecy still can like be true in this. But I, tr- I think that the beginning of this is strictly tied to what we're reading in the High Republic. And we are trying to figure out in these two phases what was the sin done to the nameless. Um, only through the sacrifice of many Jedi will the Order cleanse that sin. Um, and the danger sleeps in an egg. And when it cracks, the galaxy will be threatened, right? And we have the imagery of the egg cracking uh, in the nameless terror and path of deceit. And path mm. of vengeance right so that mm. imagery is there uh it's very clear that this is about the high republic and, and it being eggs. And, and claudia gray writing this after they had already held their retreat at skywalker ranch to mm. plan out a whole initiative around what do the jedi fear right so it's all connected it's all connected this is one of the like i think you and I agree, like not enough people talk about this prophecy. I feel like we're the only ones talking about it. Is nobody else talking about it? Brad, the, the, this prophecy to you is what the case wrath device is to me. <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's a good way to describe it. Like um, this prophecy, I mean, like I if feel you were very like, strongly about it too, but it's your baby. If you were like, Hey, Hey, I can't run a marathon. I just can't do it. And you read this prophecy to me. I'd go out and run the whole 26.2 <laughs> and like, insane record speed it just pumps the blood in my veins differently it pumps them differently okay so that's the context right what was your question <laughs> i don't know what my question was um was it this is this the sin is that what you were asking oh, is that, that how we was got the here? question that i did post to you is this is this you know we we've we had a conversation about this i think off air and i was like brad are the leveler and the nameless two different things you know because we first knew about God, I'm trying to, it's like the baby Yoda Grogu moment. It's like, what came first in these namings? But I think it was always the leveler, like with the Martian, like I think it was the leveler. And then we start talking about the nameless, the nameless, the nameless. And we're like, oh, I mean, yeah, yes. And right. Like squares and rectangles, all, all, uh, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares kind of a situation. Uh, all, uh, all. The leveler is the nameless, but not all nameless are the leveler. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm, like, I'm really trying to figure this out in my brain. Um, and so I don't know where I was going with that, but like, oh, where I was going with that is now we have the name, the nameless, which connects it to this prophecy pretty explicitly, in my opinion. Um, 
And so there's a sin done to them. And I would say that the sin done to them is they were taken out of their environment quite forcefully in a way that disrupted the planet of the force. It disrupted the beings who were in the caves, the protector and, and the other being that, you know, tries to kill our heroes uh, who are actually kind of villains. Um, it's complicated. Um, but like, I don't know. It feels like this is the sin in a way that they're being taken out of their homes. They're being brought elsewhere to feed and to kill and not it's not like they're in a you know it's not like we're in the jungle and there's a king of the jungle sort of situation they're being explicitly controlled by the mother and by marta with the rod of seasons and the rod of daybreak there's a lot of questions here and how that all happens but it certainly feels like this is uh the deepest disrespect to another you know, one of the deepest disrespects you can do to another living being. And the leveler is a living being. I agree with everything you said. And we, we have talked about this before too. Like we, we have actually alluded to the idea of like, maybe the sin is that they were taken from planet X and we've talked oh, about yeah, that. Yeah. And I, I think path of vengeance is without a doubt, the most confirmation that we have gotten that, that, is, that is the sin. Don't you think? Yeah. It's like, we actually see the sin being essentially uh, done. I mean, it was already done by Sunshine when he stole the first egg. That is the leveler. And now we see the nameless taken like the, you know, nameless plural, many of them uh, being taken. And I think this is like the most inciting event uh, of of that planet. Right. Because it's not just one. It's like multiple eggs right. being taken. Um, and yeah, I mean, talking about the free will of the leveler, I think this book, we see several points the leveler described in a way that makes you really want to feel empathy for it. Um, mm. at one point when the, the mother gets the rod of daybreak, it says the leveler whimpers and dropped its head in between its paws. Like that's such a vivid image of like, when you think of a dog being sad, it's putting its head between its paws and it evokes that sense of emotion of like, Oh God, something, something about the situation is not right. Like it's rubbing me the wrong way. Right. And when the rods get connected, uh, it says Yana couldn't tell if it was a cry of pain or triumph from the leveler. Um, mm. And the creature was visibly shaking as it was commanded. Right. So clearly this leveler doesn't doesn't want to be involved with whatever is going on. It it feels like something is wrong. It doesn't want to do what it's being bidded to do, um, but it knows it has no choice because that is its fun. Its function is to feed and consume the force like that is what it serves. Uh, and that's what it has to do, but now it's being done at the expense of somebody else and somebody else's greed and power trip. Yep. Feels bad. It's, it's so interesting to me because over the course of these stories, we've gotten more and more of the leveler and the nameless. I'm just gonna, you know, if I talk about the leveler, know that I'm also talking about the nameless. Capiche? Capache. Leveler, right. leveler and company. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> The more we've gotten about like the leveler over time, the more interesting that they have become because originally like when we got them in like what the rising storm specifically, it was kind of like a blur, right? They were like a creature, but they were a blur. And Martian had a purple artifact of some sort that was passed down in his family. That's kind right. of all we knew, right? Right. Very, very sort of um, vague depictions i don't I don't know if i recall having like a, a an idea of what the leveler looked like and then we got the comics right and then the comics showed us a very visual representation of the leveler and we were like shit this is really scary it's really scary then like in these books with the ya novels you know we get some talk about how the leveler and the nameless grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger like very very quickly and also the more they feed so now we're getting a sense for their size and their prowess like it seems like they're becoming more and more alive and not in like a literal sense but to us the reader more and more vivid as a character um which has been a really interesting process because again like reading the rising storm and having the sort of reaction we did to the end of that book which was like <laughs> what um <laughs> never seen anything like that in star wars before it was right. like and unprecedented even, and even in the fallen star we didn't really have a, a depiction of what the leveler looked like when it was causing the fear in our jedi right and but we were now, we were experiencing what the leveler could be from their perspective it's like all right. we knew was what they felt right but now it feels like we're getting such detailed 
descriptive visual representations of this this genuine creature who this genuine animal who is being like abused um and it, it gives you a different perspective on the leveler right like it it um humanizes in a way the leveler and and that this is not their doing this is the doing of the the path on the nile you know they're they're at their mercy um and maybe they do want to feed on the force like this like that's probably their natural instinct but that's why they stay in planet x right like so that's a exactly space for them exactly and yes now we've taken them from that place it's bad okay it's like when you it's like when uh like insects or animals that are are you know designed uh or not designed but are meant to be in a certain climate you know they become right. an invasive species once they're introduced to a different climate right and so that's what's that's, happening you're so right with the leveler is like it's now been introduced into the galaxy and the galaxy is like and the force is like please don't do this it's going to consume the force and right. once that pandora's box opens once that egg cracks it threatens the galaxy entire as the as the uh, prophecy says but um, one other thing too that the mother said in this was quote the imbalance will be put right but only after a great deal of suffering the force has shown me that and i think that's the closest that we've gotten verbatim to only through sacrifice of many jedi will the order cleanse the sin done to the nameless like she is saying there is an imbalance many people have to suffer to cure that but what she doesn't realize is that she created the imbalance and now the jedi are going to be the ones that suffer for it Right. Even though they're not actually the ones who created it and caused the stir to begin with, right? It's and so she's backwards. She's going to suffer for it. Yeah, yeah. It is backwards, and it's like it's it's well, that's that's inequality. <laughs> and the right? sacrifice like, of many Jedi is like what we see in Phase One and probably into Phase Three. It's like there's just going to be a lot okay. of a lot of pain in the galaxy because of this act that was done. I have a I have a thought here. Ooh, I do love thoughts. That's why I, I host do, a podcast hey, with you. I think sometimes. Woohoo! Occasionally. Thinking is um, fun. Woohoo! Um, okay, my thought is this. You know, only through the sacrifice of many Jedi. Now, here's an interesting thought. We've talked about the chosen one side of this prophecy and, you know, Order 66, as well as the, the you know, the Clone Wars as potential... Uh, ways of writing or ways of reading this but what if we read this as a conscious effort only through the sacrifice of many jedi now sacrifice can be or sacrifice can be two things sacrifice can be involuntary or sacrifice can be voluntary right what if i know where you're going with this i know where you're going with this do you um Continue. What if th- there is a mission of the Jedi to return the leveler and the nameless to planet X and Jedi well, Jedi have a, have a responsibility to protect all life. Right. And, and what if the Jedi try and make it right by hauling wrath tars more or less <laughs> to planet X and it doesn't go so well for them because they are making a, a, an explicit sacrifice in order to, uh, or an intentional sacrifice in order to ride the ways of the force. Avar Elzar is dying this way. Like, <laughs> I hate you so much. I, I'm and what so if that's, sorry. What if that's the, the trials thing. of the Jedi? Here's, what if that's yeah, the trials? Here's is like the thing, Brad. If I if this is not my novel thought, then you know, Claudia or Justina or George or Kevin or Charles or uh, Tessa or Zoraida or any, any of the above, any of the okay. Uh, any of these authors that we love daniel Alyssa, any 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 of them they're all, we're all clearly all on a first name basis at this point um they've already thought it too and they've already killed our favorite characters okay brad we just have to accept this at this point <laughs> i i can't believe you right now i can't I'm believe you but cry. like I, in all honesty like the whole time you were talking <laughs> listeners i was like freaking out in the background he like was. clutching my my head because yeah sacrifice is the key word that is right I think a voluntary sacrifice has to be the thing that cl- cleanses the sin, right? Because if it's involuntary, it's not necessarily genuine. Like the Jedi are going to have to realize w- we're going to die doing this, but it's what's right for the galaxy. Because like the thing between the dark side and the light and what makes the light, the light is again, greed, power, and, and mm. the desire to cheat death is what defines the dark side. <gasps> 
And the thing about the Jedi is that they are okay with dying. They are okay with letting go. That's what defines a Jedi. It's letting go of the fear of death. What do the Jedi... What do the Jedi fear? <laughs> Death. They'd fear dying. Let go of that fear and let go and you transcend into the force and become something beyond that. You become a force ghost. You become a new being, right? Like force is a natural part of life as Yoda says, or death is a natural part of life as Yoda says, right? And that's what that has to be for these characters. And I think it makes sense. Like the trials of the Jedi is facing death, looking it in the eyes and saying, I accept you. I, I, I embrace your gift as a gift to me. And I give to and I give a gift freely given back to the force by returning the nameless to their planet. Fuck. So fuck. So Brad, I'm gonna throw another one your way. <laughs> Please don't. I'm traumatized enough. No, I actually am, and it's gonna hurt even more. Okay. Um, no. Okay. So it's not. <gasps> it's not. What if one of them, Avar Elzar, go to Planet X? But what if both of them go to Planet X, knowing that they can't return? And oh what my if, gosh. I mean. They could theoretically. What if we kissed? What if we kissed in the veil as we return the nameless back to Planet X? Two fingers pointing at each other, being pushed together. (laughs) Emoji, cry emoji. What if we kissed? What if we kissed in the veil? (laughs) (laughs) What if we kissed on Planet X, where all of our force sensitivities are much heightened um, right before we die? Um, What if it's not a choice that one of them makes, but a choice that both of them makes? And then it's like the happy, tragic ending where like maybe they get to live until they're old, but like isolated on this force planet where they know they can't leave. Anyway, this is Oh my gosh. I'm just thinking about a lot of things today, I guess. I've been thinking a lot of thoughts today and they're manifesting themselves in this conversation. (laughs) Stellan's force ghost appears. Farming Elzar? Really? Elzar's like, it's a quiet life. (laughs) Maybe all the force ghosts, maybe all the, maybe, you, you know what? I'm just throwing ones out here. Just, I just Lucasfilm hire me. I'm ready to give you all my Star Wars thoughts. Um, on salary, of course. Um, what if, <laughs> what if we we believe Planet X to be the 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 nexus of Forks Nexus seas? Like, what if that's where? What if that's where Force Ghosts go to die? And by go to die, I mean like are stuck until they can. Like, how does a Force Ghost? make their way back into um a physical ish form where are they before that in the force maybe they are at a force nexus maybe they are ghosty ghosty living farming their ghosty ghosty fruits and veggies on planet x i don't know i'm just thinking thoughts maybe maybe it's the garden of eden Maybe it's heaven. We're bringing the Bible back into it. Of course we are. Um, I don't know, but like, I'm just, I'm just thinking things. Elzar and Avar are Adam and Eve and they return to the garden to get rid of sin. We know that Elzar is certainly a sinner in more ways than one. You know, he kind of, he kind of fucks. Oh, is that what you're going to say? I was going to say he kind of fucks up. (laughs) Oh, well, yeah. Get you a man who can do both. Fucks up and fucks. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, but why stop at just Elzar and Avar going to Planet X? Why not all the characters that we know? No, because, you know, some of them have to make it. Some of them have Do to. They? Yoda's got to live. I mean, well, okay, Yoda lives, but we Vernestra, know Vernestra lives Vernestra's in the Acolyte, gotta live. but what if part Avon of Vernestra, Staros, what if Vernestra is missing? Keeve Trennis uh, becomes a lost 20. Um, I mean, oh, I'm just saying, what, I think wait, we might. Let's weave. Hey. Let's weave her into the the novel storyline. Maybe she rejects death. Keep Trennis. Keep Trennis. Mm. And that's why she goes off in this other way. Like, why do we have to sacrifice ourselves in the name of the force? I don't know. I'm just saying shit at this point. Speaking of like the sin done to the nameless, I I think, can we talk about Kalar, who is on the ship as they pierce the veil? Um, Would you like to read what Kalar is saying? I have it here on the uh, the old Google Doc. Their name is uh, is said a tiny bit differently in the audiobook but i forget what gotcha um but would you like to uh talk so kalar as they're going through the veil kalar is like speak speaking on behalf of the veil um yeah, and marta even of, aren't they dead too they are well sunshine shoots them at oh. one point to stop them from talking um but like yeah. right before that marta marta could sense that the veil was actually crying it's it's a it's it's the force the yeah capital t that capital f the force um yeah so, so why don't, you, why don't says, you read this yeah 
Kaylar says, we need to go back. We shouldn't be here. This is wrong. Why won't you listen? You'll kill us all. You'll kill us, kill us. It's not too late. Not too late. Have to go back. Have to turn around. What did I tell you? We should have gone back. We will go back, go back, make you go back. The force is chained. The force will die. The force will be consumed. All will be consumed. All killed. Yes, all must die. Die and die and die. And so the galaxy will live. I didn't know it before. I know it now. They will come for us. The nameless horror, the shriek arai. They will come for us all. The storm shall rise and the stars fall. All because you cross the veil. Because of you, the force will die. The force no more. Wait. <laughs> the storm arai. shall rise and the stars fall. The storm, the Nile rise, the stars fall, the starlight beacon falls. The starlight beacon falls, the great hyperspace disaster into, you know. Uh, atmosphere. Kellar is literally falling. prophesizing what happens to the Starlight Beacon here. These are those exact words. That's insane. That's insane. Die and dying dies. So the galaxy must live. That's the that's the sacrifice of many Jedi. So the sin done to the nameless will be cleansed, and the galaxy can survive and live on. That's that. And they're warning: don't do this. This is going to have to happen if you do this. Right? It's giving like Star Trek. It's giving start. If I might, if I might, little Star Trek tangent. Go for it, bestie. Christopher Pike has to make a sacrifice himself in order to write the future and to make sure that the timeline exists the way it needs to exist. Yeah. Because if he doesn't, great things, grave things will happen. Right. And I, I'm getting that vibe here. It's like, that's the Jedi's responsibility, right? Like the Jedi are mm. going to have to face fear, uh, the face, the fear of death, because if it's not them dying, it's somebody else. Right. You know? Right. Anyways. <sighs> There's also um, Bacana when he's in the caves. Yeah. Bacana's looking, Bacana's looking into, the, into the dark uh, when the Underdwellers are coming up. And he says, they're coming. We're doing what they've wanted. The blight will come. The blight will spread. And nothing will be able to contain it. The Force will be chained, Marta. The Force no more. Death to the Force. Death to the Force. This is the so, first time we've heard the Force will be chained. What do you make of that statement? Because we've heard, like, the Force will be consumed. And that was pretty obvious. But, like, what do you, what do you think of the like the chaining being the verb now that is being brought up versus like consume as we've I hate it. Traditionally heard it. Yeah. It's really it's kind of ugly. It's an ugly sound. Um oh boy, it's really compelling because it requires you to think about an active choice, like an active chaining. You know, consumption is a choice, but consumption is also just like a part of life, right? Like the life cycle is is one of consumption oppression in this way chaining is not a natural thing it's a it's a it's a specific choice to chain something or someone right like it's restrictive you know, do you know what i'm kind of getting at it's like yeah. it's restrictive but it's also con like a conscious choice like you know like literally consumption is part of the life cycle you you eat and you <laughs> you eat your shit and you die like like and and like but in, like in all seriousness you look at you look at your diagram of like the ecosystem and yeah. you know this eats this and it decomposes into this and this eats this and it decomposes into this and that's just like how it works consumption is part of the system mm -hmm. we're all you know the force is all coming through us and out of us and whatever right like it's a part of all things um we all use it in different ways in the in the, in the star wars galaxy but a chaining that's like a very a very conscious action a very conscious choice you choose to harm somebody else in this sort of way mm -hmm. it's not like oh sorry i bumped into you you know i don't know i don't know where i'm getting but it, i don't like it. it i mean it really speaks to what the mother is doing and what marta is doing with the rod of seasons and the rod of daybreak and what the nile will do is is a an active oppressive act of you know tethering or chaining or yeah restricting i don't know yeah i think yeah chaining i think of like you know a loss of freedom uh, a restrictiveness to it um and if the force is being consumed that's one thing but if the force is being chained it's basically saying whatever force is left in the galaxy will be restricted and unable to be tapped into or used mm. which is interesting coming from a planet that is is full of the force and heightens the force and it is uh it is quite literally doing what the path we're worried about, which is if the force gets used in one way here, it sickens everywhere else. And mm. which goes back to the prophecy from Master and Apprentice, which says, when the force itself sickens, past and future must split and combine, right? So like that there there it is to all wrap it together. Um 
past and future must split phase one to phase two and combine in phase three, right? So Ooh. that's where that's where it's we're meta reading. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm um, will uh, we'll see. Uh, nervous laughter. Uh, pain. 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 Continuing on egg talk. Yeah, I think we should talk about the trials of the Jedi a little bit more. Um, because you mentioned you brought up the really painful point that maybe the Jedi will have to voluntarily sacrifice themselves to cleanse that sin and it made me start thinking of like what is the destiny of a jedi and and we have really recontextualized it recontextualized the luke skywalker quote from mm. the rise of skywalker which is like the the destiny of a jedi uh um, confronting fear is the destiny of a jedi and i think that is is sort of the impetus for um for the higher public, but you had a really great point and, and we're, we're going to get into Maddie's journey in this and her own trial of being a Jedi and, and, and how that might expand to phase three in the trial of the Jedi overall. But like you had a really great point about like fear and how fear is kind of becoming a new star Wars buzzword. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Cause I thought it was great right. when, we, when we discussed it. So like fear, fear is one of those things right like 2015 to 2017 or even 2018 hope was like the big west buzzword it was like how rogue one then what do we have we have hope you know um it's it just like was a word that popped up everywhere and it felt like it felt like the moment and you know confronting fear dealing with fear has always been a huge part of the jedi journey and a huge part of the stories that we've been shown over the course of the past 45 years but I didn't always feel like it was explicit in this language. And maybe I'm totally, totally missing things. Um, but it didn't feel like the focus of of the stories. You know, it felt like the adventure or what have you. Now, in 2019 with The Rise of Skywalker, Luke Skywalker pretty explicitly says to Rey, like, confronting fear is the destiny of the Jedi. That's even in the trailer, I think, too. I think so. Yeah. And it's one of those things that, like, I don't know how I feel about it, but, like, that's another conversation for another day. But, like, since then, it feels like this topic specifically and explicitly of fear and, like, hey, I'm a Jedi and we're going to talk about fear has become the thing since. Like, that is the entire basis of the High Republic. The entire basis. Like, what do the Jedi fear? And f- confronting that fear, facing that fear. And it's just popped up everywhere since then. And like actually saying the word fear. So I don't know what the point is on that, but that that's that's the thought I've been thinking. And maybe I've been missing something because I was so focused on hope that I was missing fear. But like, I don't know. It feels like we've moved from hope to fear in a way. Well, yeah, you had a great point, though, because for so long we had so many stories that were sitting in that rebellion era. And I think everything about the rebellion mm. versus the empire is hope. Right. Like, rebellions are built on hope. Hope is like the sun, et cetera. And to really differentiate the high Republic. It's like, well, what if we really dug our heels into the idea of fear? Like, cause we know Yoda says sure. fear is the path to the dark side. It leads to anger, to hate, to suffering. And what if we really explored that and made that the fo- focus? Like what if we put fear in the spotlight and made that the new buzzword over hope? And like, what does it mean to confront fear as a Jedi? Right? Like Luke says it, confront your fear. And it, like in that movie, it seems like ah, I'm going to, blast a guy with his lightning and melts his face off ah confronting right, fear right <laughs> which you know that's one way of of spinning it but i think like the high republic is taking it to like a whole new level where it is about our own personal journeys with fear and how every jedi experiences fear in a different way um but not only that it's it's literally personified and um physically manifested through the leveler as a being yeah fear, yeah. fear is the leveler that th- those two things are the same right mm-hmm. and it started to make me think like where does yoda get that phrase from in the phantom menace it's like maybe that fear leads to anger hate hate suffering line of thinking comes from what he experienced in the high republic mm. because he saw it firsthand he saw what fear led to aha uh-huh. you know uh-huh. brad i think you figured it out <laughs> <laughs> that would be a perfect basis for why yoda would have this this uh path <laughs> Pun intended right? way of thinking. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's best shown through Maddie in this book. I think Maddie is such a critical character and the way that she confronts fear. And it, it kind of all starts with Vildar when before she leaves to go to Dalna, Vildar tells her, um, if there's one thing I've learned on Jeddah. What, uh, one thing you and Tay have taught me: keeping secrets, especially from ourselves, never ends well. 
Mm. We are Jedi. We're always better when we work together. So that's like setting up this foundation of what will be her journey in the book, which I find I find very funny because <laughs> Cataclysm, Yoda, and Creighton are like secrets. Secrets are very fun because we don't share them with everybody. So let's keep one buddy, you know. Right. And Vildar's like, don't do that. We're stronger together. And then Yoda's like, psych. Well, it's kind of like um, who's right in the end. We know how we know how it goes for Anakin, you know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Yoda. Maybe Yoda's not totally right about the secrets are fun for us. <laughs> Concealment is not good. I mean, we know we know he's wrong. In fact, yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> just Yoda things. And then Maddie sort of synthesizes these other two lessons, like ones from Master Liban and ones from Tay and and Liban at one point in the past told her the trick is to acknowledge how you are feeling and more importantly understand why you are feeling that way then and only then will you be able to ask yourself the questions that will help you control your emotions to overcome to overcome the burden you bear and like what is that burden it is fear mm-hmm. uh, and i think like the current day jedi lack the ability to do that like they don't understand why they feel they just say don't feel it's in the jedi code the jedi code says there is no emotion there is peace right it's literally mm-hmm. saying emotion no just peace just harmony that's all that matters and it's like realistically that's not what it means to be a living being you have emotion no matter what like you experience those things and you have to know how to confront them and and deal with them and acknowledge them and understand why you're feeling that way right yeah and ultimately like you want to find that zen and that's what the the, you know the jedi are looking for is finding that kind of inner peace but you in order to do that you have to be able to go through the the highs and the lows and have the tools to deal with those things and that's the piece that the jedi are missing is Mm -hmm. is developing the tools to deal with the highs and the lows in order to uh, approach that kind of middle ground that that inner peace and that's what that's why anakin turns right because right he tries to acknowledge how he feels he is shunned for it and then he never understands why he's feeling that way yoda just says let go of all you fear to lose like he doesn't actually talk through it with him like why do you feel this way Anakin? you know some of them should have gone to be like have some degrees in psychology i think in the jedi they could have probably benefited from that there's got to be one right or is it just like they just totally messed up and forgot about psychology as a whole field <laughs> you know maybe they they have psychology as a field and maybe they have like psychologist jedis or jedis who study psychology but it's just like a sort of like a side it's a side quest for them you know it's like yeah. a, it's like a you know that's that's great for you Comac vitas he's a folklore a folklorist and a historian and you're just a psychologist and that's that's cool and shit but like <laughs> does it have any tangible effect to the jedi jedi's daily life i mean i mean are you useful in a lightsaber training no so <laughs> your utility is low mr or miss you know psychologist jedi Jedi are kind of like capitalists in a way that like capitalism, it's your, your value is derived from how much you contribute to capitalism. And the Jedi are like, how much do you, (laughs) how much do you contribute to fighting war? And that's why they, that's why they lose the clone war. (laughs) Well, yeah. And, and you know, they, they, they take Olivia, but they don't take Alicia. So you have, you have this disconnect you know she doesn't provide enough value to them as force users and her as a force user for her to be chosen by the jedi to come and train with them (sighs) yeah that's some real capitalist thinking right now you don't provide enough utility to me i therefore (laughs) will not nurture your force abilities and i want to make a full disclaimer like we are not full on jedi haters we just recognize like what their legacy ends up being and how they go from like a high point in the high republic to the place they are in the prequels you don't and speak I think, for me brad well i mean <laughs> i'm kidding i'm we, not a jedi hater but i but i am a giant fan of um the legacy of the jedi by hubris so it's like we know what the jedi aspire to be oh, um, no it's the legacy and, of the jedi's failure let me get the line yeah, right. i'm so sorry oh. I have, i've corrected the line you may now continue <laughs> like we know what the jedi aspire to be and i think that goal is good it is a, objectively a good mm. goal is to be mm. like the protectors of light but they stay uh they stray so far from that path into the prequels and i think that's what the acolyte and what leslie is trying to do is really connect like how do they become from what they are in the high republic to what they are in the prequels and that's something that inspired her for creating the show which we'll see Mm. more of but um did you want to read this quote from tay 
I'll read this quote from Tay. But in, while I'm finding this quote from Tay, I also just want to say that, holy shit, the acolyte is happening and probably relatively in the grand scheme of things soon because it'll happen sooner than Celebration Japan. So um, soon. Anyway, um, here's this quote from Tay on page 178. If you are following along at home. We all get scared from time to time, guardians, daring but handsome thieves, even over-talkative Padawans. The question is how we deal with it. Do we run and hide or do we face our fear and damn the consequences? I think you'll find out for yourself when it happens and you'll be surprised how well you cope. Not because you're a Jedi, not because of the robes or the lightsaber or even the force, but because of who you are inside, where it matters. He brought it home. That's a damn good quote. It's... It's, I really like how it speaks to, um, the complexity and adaptability of people, which is, I think you'll find out for yourself when it happens and you'll be surprised with how well you cope. (laughs) Um, uh, because if I may do my classic Sarah book talk thing of bringing it back to, you know, real life (laughs) and my many times of crying on the pod, um, it's, it's one of those things where you know, we don't ask for change in our lives a lot of time, right? We don't, we don't ask for bad things to happen. We don't ask for big life changes to occur in a ways that affect us negatively. You know, we want to move through life, uh, happy and healthy and, um, surrounded by our loved ones and friends and, you know, being able to celebrate all of those things. Right. It's like when COVID hit, you'll, you'll find out what, how you cope when it happens. And like, for me, it was puzzles and audiobooks for months um and you know did I cope well I mean I gotta be kind to myself I look back and I go you made it through and that's that's the answer and and that fear that uncertainty and how I handled that and the things things that I could control I did control and the things that I couldn't I didn't in working through that over time I'm proud of myself looking back because I have to be right I have to give I extend myself Mm -hmm. that grace so I think that this is what this quote is getting at. Um, you know, we don't ask to be scared. We don't ask for change. We don't ask for all the, any of these terrible things to happen, but you know, humans are adaptable. People are adaptable. Beings are adaptable to different environments, different stressors and things. And we all deal with a lot of things that we don't want to. <laughs> That's part of living, I guess. So Maddie dealing with this very, very real human thing, um, is valuable to a reader and to Maddie, the character who's fictional. <laughs> yeah, and Maddie Maddie synthesizes all of those lessons that she takes from from Tay and from Vildar and from uh, Master Liban. And page four ninety one, she says, "Jedi can be afraid. Jedi can be scared. There's no shame in it. Everyone is scared at one time or another. The difference for a Jedi is that we know fear is fleeting and should never win. A Jedi never runs from their fear. They face it, safe in the knowledge that the Force is with them, and they are one with the Force. And that you know connects to that classic line that we love." From Cheer at Mway. Can I make a uh, comment in, in about Malibus. that line specifically? Yeah. Can we get some other force prayers up in here? Please. <laughs> Apparently, like in other versions of the scripts, there were other ones. Why are there not other ones still? Please let us have other force prayers for the love of God. They cannot be a religion that has a single prayer. I know, I know, like the Christians and the Catholics and you know, any people, right? Where are the other important prayers? This is this is a really important side tangent to me because I actually am at, to a point where I'm getting a little bit frustrated that this is the single prayer like chant that comes up every time the Jedi are going through something and they're like, oh, I need to connect the force. I want the force of force of I want have some creativity. hot take with Sarah. Oh, hot boy. take. I like I I am not on my soapbox right now because my soapbox is holding my it's my soapbox step stool. My soapbox step stool is holding my um, extension cord so that I can raise this desk that I sit at to standing level when I want to stand at it. Um, so it's, it's out of commission right now, but imagine I'm standing on my step stool soapbox. I feel really strongly about this. I'm so sorry to derail your thought that was thoughtful and good, but like, I really needed to get it out of my system. This is serious business. This is serious. <laughs> I mean, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that I think this quote was great because Maddie even acknowledging that there's no shame in being scared, I think is so mm-hmm. important, right? Because I think when we're scared, we feel at our most vulnerable. And mm-hmm. sometimes uh, there is not a great comfort in having that vulnerability. And I know a, a person or two in my life throughout my life who I've seen them get scared and their first instinct is anger because they're scared and they don't like being scared. And, and you know, Maddie saying fear is fleeting and should never win that made me think of emmerich Cant- uh, cantor from 
Trail of Shadows, when he faces the leveler, uh, one of the only Jedi to actually see it for what it is, it's because in that moment he tells himself fear is an illusion and it's only what I kind of take with me. And mm-hmm. if I let go of that fear and look it in the eye, damn the consequences that Tay says, I'll see what, what it truly is. And he sees the leveler and that's what happens, right? And so there's this moment where she takes these lessons, she takes this mentality that she has, and when they're being affected by the leveler, she starts thinking of moments from her past of, of Vildar and Tay and Olivia and Aslan. Uh, and she realizes the, the answer to overcoming these effects is that we need each other. We can't beat it on our own. And um, I hate to bring up Harry Potter, but it's the best thing I could think of in this moment was like, you know, when Harry is in the Ministry of Magic and he beats Voldemort by thinking of his friends mm, in that moment mm. because he, know, he knows Voldemort will never experience love. And right. so I thought of that in this moment where like Maddie's answer to confronting fear and dealing with it is knowing that fear is fleeting. I have my friends. I have people that love me and I love them and, and uh, they will always be there for me and the force will be there for me. And that is all the knowledge I need. Right. And that ties together with like our question of phase three will be how do Jedi deal with fear? Do they deal with fear by Maddie's method or do they deal with it through anger? Uh, and turn to the dark side because of that fear you mentioned like okay you talking about fear and like fear is what you take with you about like i'm i'm tangenting but i'm tangenting to star wars so we're keeping it in house um i'm thinking of that one fact pop story the one cave story Mm. do you know the one i'm talking about yeah yeah cool 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 i don't have any more details of Right. I don't have any more details of that one. I just thought of that one. Um, but the other thing I thought about is literally Shadowfall chapter 18. You are what you take with you that, or whatever that chapter is called. Um, and the way that they deal with fear in that chapter, which is it's like majorly messed up. Um, um, that chapter. Traumatizing. <laughs> um, Never forget. <laughs> but like chapter 18. I I'm I'm derailing from your very good points, but uh, I, I think that you know, you hit everything on the head with the story of fear and, um, and, and the way that it's fleeting and, and how ultimately fear is up. I hate to say path on a fucking episode called path of vengeance, where every time I say path, it's very, like, feels very cliche, but like there's a pathway through fear and maybe it's, it's, you know, there are two paths in a wood and I take the one less traveled on. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe there are multiple options in your, in your fear, but um, there's a pathway out of it. There is a light at the end of the tunnel because it is fleeting. The two paths are, are what will be critical to phase three is like, which right. path do you take? And maybe there is a middle path. Like maybe that's the path that Keeve Trennis takes because she just says, listen, I'm out. The Jedi lied to us about this threat and I'm out. I'm, I'm maybe? over it. Maybe she becomes a ringleader for the way seekers and like that's why way seeking is abolished and does not exist by the time that we get to the prequels because um she becomes one of the lost training because she's like leads a way seeker rebellion and she's like you guys, and the way seekers are like you guys are doing it wrong Jedi and she's like yeah you guys are doing it wrong Jedi and then the Jedi are like talk to the hand and goodbye and she's like well screw you and becomes a dark star. I'm throwing out theories Lucasfilm please pay me if you want to use them. <laughs> But like, you know, there's a lot of different options here. I think tying it back to our thought that the thing the Jedi will have to do is return the nameless to their planet. And with that in mind, with that in mind, it's like, okay, well, they can't just kill the nameless and be like, yay, we won. Because we that's fought a death, them. Right. We that's, killed that's them. A, a, uh, an imbalance in the force, perhaps. Right. That's the thing. Fear is the real threat. Fear is the threat and the nameless are just a, a vessel through which fear exists and uh, reveals itself. Or in many cases, doesn't reveal itself and, and, and reveals imagery that's not really there. Monsters and, and visions and things that you are scared of, right? That's oftentimes the effects of the Jedi is like everything in the room became a monster, you know? Mm. Oh, yeah. That's something new that felt like it popped up in this. I think maybe this book. And so it's just fascinating that like the thing in phase three that will win the day is not a weapon. Uh, it's not like any tools. It's just a mental game. 
it's a mental game to confront fear. And then once that fear is confronted, say, Hey, we, we confronted our fear. Let's now return the, the levelers. They are, mm. they are creatures, part of the force. All life is sacred. Let's bring them home. And that's, that's the end of the high Republic. All life is sacred, except for Marshy and Rose life. And he's getting dead. <laughs> yeah. Down. We can throw him off the, uh, the plank. <laughs> right. Into space. So thinking about all this and, and what Maddie has to deal with, I thought that it was interesting post battle. Mm. She doesn't remember much. And it just says that <gasps> something about monsters nagged the corner of her mind, but that must have been an illusion caused by the rod. And one, uh, the word illusion popping up again from trailer uh, once seen in trailer shadows is like the idea that fear is an illusion. Um, but it was interesting that, she sort of blames what she saw on the rod and the fact that the leveler is maybe not real or like the monster was not real when it really is. I just found that intriguing. And that sort of explains why current day Jedi don't really remember. And maybe that's why the, the, the fables get passed down the way they do is because mm. people think people kind of uh, recreate the images in their mind and don't really know where it's from. Um, <laughs> we were talking about the nursery rhyme. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like we were like, how the fuck a duck? Shriek Kai Rai Kai Rai. Like and then you were like, Well, what if it's not like a conscious thing necessarily that's passed down? Well, who might have passed that down? The nursery rhyme. I think we should introduce our last talking point of this episode, which is a, a man known as Aslan Rell, who we first met in Path of Deceit. And discovers the bodies of two Jedi fallen in the caves on Dalna, who are husked, husked remains. R.I.P. Kevmo Zink and what? Zalamakri? Yep. R.I.P. Pour one out. F in the chat. <laughs> Press F to pay respects. <laughs> 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 we're, we're saluting right now we're just saluting on camera we're gonna salute the rest of the episode while we talk so i'm so sad aslan about rel, it still <laughs> aslan rel not to be dramatic not to be dramatic although to be fully dramatic he is the key to all of this yeah yeah yeah. you've coolly convinced me of this aslan's one of those characters that really does not do well in this when he experiences the effects of the leveler and at maddie all. has to help him at one point because he wants her to leave him and she's Twice. like, no, we are stronger together. Again, that lesson. We are stronger together. We need to go together. This is how we win. And uh, right. he goes with her. Um, but he sort of just derails mentally from there. And towards the end of the book, uh, he is seen scribbling maniacally, uh, manically on sheets of paper with a blunt stylus. Uh, Patty even wonders, where in the light had he found paper? Uh, so paper is not really a big thing in Star Wars. Do you think that Ray has this piece of paper now? Do I think Ray has a piece of paper written I'm by sorry. Aslan Rell? This is such a derailment, but like she's got all the Jedi texts. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Okay. Now I understand. I was like, wait, she You're just like, like found a paper. She found a paper so, on Jakku that was like dusty old, like trash Brad, bin. That was like, an, oh, it's what an the entire heck? plot point. Oh, page, page turners. They were not, but like the Shri Kai Rai Kai Rai. Maybe. That's potential, know. potentially, who knows? But that's, Maybe that's the thing. Maybe she keeps the nursery rhyme alive when she teaches the little ones in the upcoming movie she's in. Yeah. Lucasfilm, <laughs> don't come after me. That's not a spoiler. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but what's fascinating is he is, so he's scribbling on a bunch of sheets of paper and there's this moment where he, he says he hears the voices of the Shrieker Rai and he says, there is no center, no balance, you will see. And he makes Maddie read this paper and Maddie reads, Shrikarakarai, they're coming to take you away. They'll do what they can and they'll do what they must. But when they find you and she can't even finish it and Aslan completes it for her, all you'll be is dust. We first heard this nursery rhyme in Trail of Shadows by Daniel Jose Older. And it was described uh, as an old nursery rhyme. Thanks really, for like, nothing. Thanks for my nightmares, <laughs> Daniel. Unknown origin, right? Um, and Daniel also wrote Edge of Balance Precedent. And uh, I guess a slight spoiler for precedent, not a huge spoiler, but uh, Aslan Rell is in this and he goes missing at the end of the comic. So clearly Aslan Rell went somewhere. And what does Emmer Cantor find in Trail of Shadows issue number one at the very end when he goes to Vrant Tarnum? Tell us, Brad. He finds a cave with markings on the wall that say the nursery rhyme 
the same exact words that Aslan Rell wrote on that piece of paper that Maddie read. So Aslan Rell is the one who created this, this rhyme. Uh, he somehow had it embedded in his mind from the voices of the nameless that have just had this effect on him that he's not able to overcome. He can't overcome that fear. Yeah. Aslan's not doing so well. When he told me about the cave, I was like, oh my God. So I just opened up the comic. I Readers, oh, not readers, your listeners, but you're also readers, but you're listening to this. You're not reading this. I need you to know that both Brad and I have like a stack of books next to us of like related materials. Like Brad's got Edge of uh, Balance precedent. I've got Trail of Shadows. I've got Midnight Horizon. I've got Rising Storm. And why do I have Midnight Horizon? You might ask. Well, Sarah, could Brad, you could you away. explain? No, no, no. Oh. You're gonna you're gonna take this oh, theory. I'm gonna do it. We it's we have theory. maybe a well. No, it's our theory. We've talked about okay. it together. It's I know, a, yeah. but it's like we, your thought. We've, we have updated the the mystery figure a little bit. Our, right. our theory our theory has changed. It evolves slightly. So. The theory, if you have joined us in the past, if you haven't, here's the, here's the thought. Let's get out. Hold on. No, here's, we, let's just get out of the horizon. I did this, you know, yesterday when we were chatting and then it just needs to happen again. Uh, cause you know, Brad was like, Sarah, when you get to the end of the book, like right before the end of the book, you know, it'll, it'll mess you up. You, you'll know what scene it is. And I'm like, okay, Brad. Okay. Okay. And for our, our listeners, you can embark on this journey with us by turning to midnight horizon at the bottom of page 481. Okay. A little off to the side, that strange hooded figure sat, singing as always. They'd come with Yoda, Scene had realized, and everyone had dis- when everyone had disembarked and settled at Bay News. The, f- the figure never showed their face, never spoke to anyone, just sang a sad little ditty over and over in a raspy whisper. They'll do what they can, they'll do what they must, uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but when they find you, all you'll be is dust. And then, you know, of course zine is like i'll find you lula um but missing presumed dead so (laughs) (laughs) pain i can't oh i'm not ready for phase three i'm not ready for phase three i had forgotten about missing presumed dead until you well i hadn't you brought it up the other day but yeah i i really didn't hit me until that moment as i was streaming that um and now i feel messed up and discombobulated where was i going um hooded figure mystery hooded man figure. yoda leaves right yoda leaves and he comes back and there's this hooded figure with them and then comac leaves bye comac we'll never see you again bestie um <laughs> i think we will but like that's not the point um it's just a meme <laughs> it's a great a great meme like the the mental image why are you so running silly. why are you yeah. running um okay but basically the thought here is that he's bringing someone in from the past who will be able the past and the present must split and combine maybe this goes into that but right he's bringing someone from the past who has experienced something like this before and using them to impart knowledge now we were originally thinking it was emmerich the catafor um or no creighton son sorry I don't even know anybody's names anymore. Uh, Creighton's <laughs> son, Master Creighton's son. Uh, my apologies. All the character names are so... We are such encyclopedias for this stuff, and yet we're not, because there's no Wikipedia organization in our head. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> we know so many names in the higher Republic. Like, oh if gosh. you gave me, like, an online quiz of all the names, like, I probably <laughs> do pretty decently. Because, <laughs> um, like, there are Google Docs with all their names on them. Anyway, um, w- but I would not know who they all were at this point. <laughs> Just have like a list of names. Anyway, Master Creighton Sun. We thought it was Master Creighton Sun, and we were talking about this in Cataclysm, right? Right, because okay. they sort of leave off saying, "Oh, we'll we'll never discuss this until we absolutely need to." Right, and they're in on the secret together in a, in a way. Nobody else. Yoda and Creighton is yep. right, right. Um, and so they have like some sort of history, a shared knowledge together. Now we're updating the theory. We're adding more figures into the mix here. Because I think you're right, Brad, when you brought this up to me, I think it very well could be Aslan Rell because he's like capital M, capital U messed up about this whole thing. Um, the only qu- the only connective tissue question, well, like the connective tissue question for Master Crane Son is how did Master Crane Son go from having the knowledge of the situation and saying, we're never going to talk about it again to being so messed up by it that he's just singing in a corner without taking his, you know, his cloak off right right the the connective tissue that's missing if we want to say that it's aslan rel is how do how do we find aslan rel you know like how does he get found in order for him to return 
Uh, and also, damn, he's old at this point. Um, but so Creighton's son would be even older. Anyway, not the point, but the point being you can add him to the mix as somebody who has directly experienced the effects of the leveler, suffered greatly, and is has exiled himself in one way or another. And put pen to paper with the the Shrieker Rai rhyme, Shrieker right? And he's Rai-ka-ray. saying it in that moment. And my other thought was, how would Creighton know that potentially, right? Aslan Rell is the one who wrote it on paper, scribbled it on the walls, etc., potentially. So I, I think I think this makes the most sense. And like Aslan is going to be somebody who knows like the direct effects of the leveler, what he saw when he when he succumbed to the fear. Um, and he might be sort of a case study for the Jedi to go, OK, well, here's what happened to Aslan. How do we not allow right. this to happen to us? And it might just be as simple as Aslan being like, I'm terrified. I'm scared. When do you <laughs> like how, how do you feel better, Aslan, when I'm not scared? Right. It goes back to Obi-Wan. Like. What does the force feel like and have, what does it feel like when you turn on a light in the dark? Like, that's the answer. Um, and Aslan Rell is the key to all of this, to finding that answer. And Yoda picked him potentially for a reason. And he went mm. off with Tromac, who is one of the Tromac. former littles. Tromac, that's a good thing to bring up right now. One of the former littles that Marta watched over and is now one of the elders of the path that's left over of those remnants, right? He, he, he chose Tromac specifically to go find Aslan Rell potentially and bring Aslan. So you're maybe Tromac had that knowledge. Oh, you're blowing my mind. Now I'm thinking about the connections. I just, I just remember Tromac and Yoda, like tight in the cockpit together, like in their vector and Yoda's (laughs) vector, like flying and they're like really crammed in there (laughs) and they're like flying over a planet. Oh man. Okay. I forgot about Tromac's role in the discovery of all this Uh, because they go on a side quest that we don't know about. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Mm. we don't see Yoda again until this moment and he has a new person with him and we're like, huh? Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Uh, wow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about that. (laughs) For a while. Also, I'm on Wikipedia for the Shri Kairai Kairai. Um, and it says a song was known, okay, about 35 years before 231 BBY, the elderly Jedi, 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 Jedi Rust, Rustra, Rustra, Vidivarkit sang the song to younglings over Angi's care, including Emmer Katafor and Stellan Geos, both of whom found the song frightening so many questions about that specific thing and that's in trailer shadows one i do want to say too there was a little bit of a cryptic tweet from daniel Uh-oh. uh the other day somebody oh, no. tweeted the fact that we actually won't be seeing the phase two characters ever again don't talk <gasps> to me and da- both daniel and Alyssa replied with the same emoji of the uh face with the eyeglass or the uh monocle like that's like hmm. oh it wasn't bombastic side eye, criminal side, offensive side eye. It was the monocle. Yeah, it was the monocle emoji. Mm. And then Daniel replied again to another person who posted a screenshot of that tweet. And then I replied to Daniel with my live Aslan Rel, Aslan Rel reaction meme. And then he replied with a picture of Maz Kanata looking in the air in her castle. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Well, Moss cannot have something for a long time. Yeah. I know, I know. So maybe Moss, I guess Moss comes back. I don't know. But, <laughs> no, but uh, like, you know, I think, I think, I think that all tracks in the sense of like, well, some people are old, you know? Yeah. Or maybe Daniel's listening to right, this right now and laughing at us for missing the connection. Yeah. We're all <laughs> fools. But I, I, I do think we're on the something and saying that it is, has to be Aslan Rell. I think it makes the most sense. It would be really exciting uh to reintroduce aslan and many other characters who might have that knowledge and we'll talk more about that in our phase three preview and like who is who are the key players for phase three i think what's interesting about aslan is that like we don't get a lot of aslan right like we don't know aslan well he just is like there as a guy who finds some husk jedi almost become a husk himself and then is terrified and goes away that's all we know about him really we don't like know much about who he is as a character he's got to return in some way he's got to have some 
bigger, larger meaning because he's, he's playing an important role only to exist for nothing. You know, it's, he's, he's like Dalna. (laughs) (laughs) It's not about Dalna, Sarah. It is about Dalna. You know, like it's not about Azamrel. No, Azamrel is the key to all this. He is patient zero in a way. He's the first at this point, as far as we know, he's the first ever (gasps) Jedi to see a husked remain from the leveler. Shit. Because if we're thinking that that leveler that killed Kevna was the very first leveler that cracked the egg that cracked to yeah. threaten the galaxy. Ah, Kevna was the first leveler death, man. Aslan Rell was the first better. person to ever see that. So, of course, he would have the most connection to it in a way. Time and trauma. Yeah, the most trauma because his goes as far back as being in those caves and feeling something was off and finding two bodies and then coming face to face with it later on and just being plagued by fear and not knowing why and just hearing voices in your head, you know, Aslan's a bit of a tragic story. I would recommend anybody that is on our bullshit here to uh, read edge of balance precedent, read this book, which you should have already have read if you're two hours into this, I hope and read Claudia Gray's quest of the Jedi comic, which uh, illuminates illuminates a lot of things about the rod of seasons and the rod of daybreak how, wait spoiler for and me. those yeah it's it's a good one if you want to i've know only more. read one of those three things and it's this book let me just tell you rod rods aslan rel jedi library those are the three words i'll tell oh, you to anybody to second? go read quest of the jedi wait a second you're like sarah read quest of the jedi and you never mentioned jedi library until this very moment let's let's read it after this let's go read it together right after this and we will be talking about it on our Patreon, by the way. Yeah, once I read that it. Is, that is how we are filling our time in between now and phase three, is catching up on comics. Yes. So get ready for true. more pain and suffering. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tee. Anyway. Any other thoughts on Aslan Rel or anything we've discussed before we move into our odds oh and ends? Oh my God. Because we've, we've talked about we've quite discussed? a bit. Um... Oh gosh. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like we've hit all like the main important points here. I want to say that like, I really enjoyed the structure of this book. Although my dumbass, for some reason, I think having already read like two books where like, or maybe the main book where the battle of Dalna has already taken place. I was like, Oh, we're past battle of Dalna. Why are they going back to Dalna? And then I was like, we haven't done Dalna yet. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, we're doing again. I don't know. I feel like this, this book gave me, you know, the pieces that I wanted to get from this particular storyline. So I'm glad it exists. And also path, bad path, generally pretty bad. Um, Alicia's force manipulation, pretty bad. Um, any other thoughts? I don't think so. I think we've said a lot of thoughts of the past two hours. I would just like to say it's absolutely hilarious that once upon a time, you did not think Dalna would be important you know to what? phase two. And it you, was like literally the planet of phase two. You, I think it's very you, funny. Do you want to know what? What? Screw you. <laughs> <laughs> I, you guys have to know, you guys have to know that I mean, we've told the story before, I think, but like Brad literally went, was it Star Wars Celebration this year or was it? New York Comic Con last New year. New York Comic Con last year. He literally went up to Justina and to Ta- Tassa to justina and to tessa and was like so can you write it's about donna in this inscription for my friend because she didn't think these books were going to be about donna okay i literally have a book that says dear sarah it's about donna (laughs) (laughs) they got a kick out of it by the way that i will never be able to live it and it's okay it's okay i understand that but here's the deal. It was early on. It was early on when you had this thought. And that's great. You're an early adopter. You were ahead of the game. You're ahead <laughs> of the game. That's not that's not the path for all of us. You know, like maybe <laughs> I won't use the new technology until it's been tested and proven and, you know, is not going to steal all my, you know, like a new app, steal all my personal mm. data. OK, Whoa, so maybe I, I just attacked. wasn't <laughs> wasn't ready to ad- adopt and maybe things work out and you buy into the Apple stock early and now you're a, big, a bajillionaire. OK, but not all of us are like that. Some of us live a little bit more cautiously okay that's me okay i'm not ready to make these bets i wasn't i wasn't ready for that I, i'm i'm running on my own timetable brad and yes i understand that i was wrong okay and that's okay we're allowed to be wrong sometimes just like the jedi okay it's just you'll never live it down i know <laughs> yeah i'm gonna be 
I'm going to be on my deathbed, like in the old age home, uh, when we're like 85 and I'm going to be Not at least 90 about Brad. to, I'm going to about, I'm going to be about to go. And I'm going to open Facebook Messenger, which has not had a clear chat in 65 years. And I'm going to go, Sarah, you're going to go, what? And I'm going to go, it was about Dalna. And I'm going to die. It's going to be my last thought ever. Right. My last thought. I, and I, I will really go like, gentle into that good night. Listener, you really do have to know that like Brad and I pretty much exclusively talk to each other on Facebook Messenger. We are no fans of Zuck, but like, here we are on facebook messenger every day for the past like five years yeah we over do not text, text. it's very over, funny well yeah no he didn't give me his phone number for a very yeah, long we got time the then. death star theme and messenger like why would we you change know, we get to see the death right. star every single why, day like why would we go to an inferior messaging system yeah. when we can search in our messages and pull up all of our attached documents from like five years ago don't do that that's terrifying um but the point stands yeah just the people needed to know <laughs> We might seem a little odd, and that's why we do odds and ends here. So uh, oh. let's get into them. Um, Claps for you. Snaps for that. That was a great transition. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will start here, and okay. I will say my first one is the Jedi Vault and the Dunes of Contemplation within the Statue of Jedi. Oh, I think it's so cool yeah. that we learned uh, not only is the statue, the infamous fallen statue, is a vault, but it's the vault that contained one of the rods. So that's pretty cool. Pretty damn cool. I'll never watch Rogue One the same. Yeah. I, you know, I had spent a lot of time wondering why, why this was so important in this way. And like, I'm like, I don't, they're like, oh, the statue fell. It's a statue. Like we've been having, we've been having a lot of discourse in society about the value or lack thereof of statues. And I was like, tear the statue down. I don't care. And especially like I'm with the Jedi. Okay. It fell. Knowing what was inside the statue and that was like an actually like a bogan vault that changed things for me so yeah that was good stuff and i also just like generally would have loved to not find that out in a comic but you know it's okay they, they give us different pieces of the story in different places and that's all right okay anyway my first one page 39 for anybody following along i just find little nuggets interesting we know how i love an institution of higher learning um i love kind of these these spaces and ideas that i just start in names and i'm like and i'm gonna imagine an entire backstory for them okay soon they were rampaging through the temple of the wills in the, dra in the dragarian drag drag again drag again annals um but there was no sign of the damned rod so, yeah, that's it. The dra the Dragarian, Dragergi, nope, dra drag again, drag again annals. That is my next odds and ends. You really tried on that. I I, I, I really, applaud. I, I applaud so the pronunciation. Well. Uh, I and I'm so well. I'm also happy for you that like you, you can always find a new institute of higher learning and right. new a things in Star Wars to think about. Yeah. It's you know different from Very what we so It's a different you know than like the CD underworld. It's like an interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, my next one uh, in the outfall of a Jetta, they were talking about the huts and uh, how they profit from war, and it, it says here the huts had a father in the race, and I just Aha. love I just love that phrase. You know, spinning on a horse, having a horse in the race. Uh, that's great. That's what I'm gonna exclusively say to people now. And they're going to be like, what the hell is a father here? I'm like, don't worry about it. It's fine. Don't worry about Go it. Go watch Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi. Anyways. Masterpiece. Um, legend. Iconic. Okay. Anyway, my next one is, uh, once again, I just, I, just love a, I just love a little thing. I just love a little thing. Um, the Huts and their transmissions across the galaxy use a dead language from a dead species called uh, Regarium. Regarium. Uh, and that's what they use in their comms. For some reason... Um, what's her face? Shay. Shay, who we see throughout the book, knows this language or is aware of it and, and knows how to understand it. So that's interesting. Um, but yeah, a new language called Regarium that the Huts use. They don't use Huttese. They use a totally different language and they're the only ones who know how to speak it because it's dead otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> My next one here is uh, Yana reminiscing on Kor. Uh, she thinks, quote, time alone, just the two of them breathing in each other's sense, exploring each other's bodies. It wasn't just the sex, although the sex had been incredible. 
It was the companionship fitting together with someone who couldn't have been more different in so many ways. And I just would like to emphasize that the High Republic can, in fact, does indeed fuck. And uh, I love that. And I love that. I think that's the first time I've ever seen the word sex in Star Wars, too, like explicitly like that. Oh, interesting. Kevin, Ka- Kevin gave us Elzar fucking and Kavis gave ca- gave us Yana fucking like. It just it's just a fact how is Kevin the one leading like the horny star wars agenda like that's so fascinating know. to me i love that <laughs> i love it anyways let's, con- anyway, let's continue that trend um you know anyway uh i also i thought that was a bit shocking <laughs> in the way that it was explained within a young adult book because often often yeah, true and i mean it is this is closed door there's no like other than you know the very general explanation of like touching and smelling and breathing and you know like moving together sort of a thing like there's not really a description of sex of the or like any of that but it's always so like and they were kissing and then they woke up the next morning kind of a vibe and so like this like actually says sex and you know um really kind of gives you that like feeling of of where yana was feeling i don't know i don't know where i'm going with that sense but i hope you know where i'm going with that sense um i don't know not important um page 87 I. I'm going to go ahead and get out um, Daniel's gavel of cannon, which I have stolen. Sorry, Daniel. (laughs) Because I have news. Um, My friends in the force. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Again? Um, In in the mother's communication to the galaxy, she goes, my friends in the force. And guys, that's us. We're the friends (laughs) of the force. Well, there was friends Same of vibe. the force in Path of Deceit as we're well. Canon. Well, this now is, we have this is this is me joking both because books. like they were probably both not books. going. Mm, ha ha! Yes, canon. Um, but like, <laughs> I, it's happened to us twice now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're we're not quite to the level of a uh, named a character, a uh, glup shadow character in Star Wars after Bren Sarah. But if anybody wants to do that, but complain. also, but also, like, <laughs> we will accept this as a we canon reference. Friends in the Force and Friends of the Force. Friends in the Force, Friends of the Force. These are canon references, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, we're totally joking about this. We're so joking. Um, but I was I literally read that and went, <laughs> yeah, I did like the Leonardo DiCaprio point, and I was like, I know that phrase. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I love it. It's so silly. Oh, that's a good it's so one. silly. That's a but good I really one. just had a good laugh about it. So I thought I had to share. Um, and so that's our, you know, I this is our podcast and we make the rules and we decide it's canon. Canon. Yeah. Gavel. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, my next one here is uh once they crash on Planet X, it says that Sunshine's head was quote ringing like a Phyrexian chime. And folks, that is the first reference to ferrix that we have had outside of andor awesome i love it i love my andor representation in that's my right. high republic like are you kidding me that's like all my interests my worlds colliding into one thing oh gosh it brings me so much joy cannot wait for andor season two. Oh, andor we love you so much i've been trying to convince my parents to watch andor side note i'm uh, i feel like i'm getting there but it's taking them a while i'm like it's star wars but it's like a political drama and it's like not really star wars like you'll, you can anyway they watched the last of us and liked it anyway my last one i don't know what page it is because i couldn't read my own handwriting while walking on the treadmill it's okay we learned you know we love kashik here on friends of the force and by friends of the force i mean me because there's a wookie shrine behind me don't worry about it um Wosher Wood is kind of like a you know, really important piece of the Kashyyyk and Wookiee culture. Now, Shurian Wood is how I'm going to decide to pronounce that, is even rarer than Wosher Wood. Um, and I believe in this one, it's a staff um, one of the characters has. So now we have more lore on the trees of Kashyyyk. That's it. That's the whole odds and ends. Uh, our last one here is the most unhinged possibly odds and ends. I'm going to share this one between the two of us because we somehow forgot to talk about it, even though it, we were the most frequently freaked out by it. Uh, oh. Shay is pregnant with Geth's kid. Oh, Geth, oh my God. Geth how did we miss this? How did we miss this? We, hold on. Hold the fuck. Hold the fuck. Hold the fuck. <laughs> we ta- literally talked about this before we started recording. And I was like, and, and at the top of the episode, and I was like, this messed me up. This messed me up. This, this really made me audibly like exclaim. Like, the, I'm standing up, guys. It's happened. I'm out of my seat. I can't believe we left to the end of this episode, but we actually did save the best for last. So yeah, Shay is pregnant and she tells Marta, if it's a girl, she will be named Marie as in Marie, Marie Santeca. 
Yeah. As in the yeah. keeper of the paths, as in yeah. the reason the Nile can travel hyperspace, as in Maria Santaco, who was stolen by the Nile and the Rose. I have questions. You I have, have lots of thoughts I have que- I don't and have speculations. Um, I feel like, man, I got to get Dino down here. Um, he's just got to join in this discussion. We feel very passionately about this. Um, okay. So this is so messed up. Uh, <laughs> This is all messed up. Okay, right. So Shay pregnant and then Mari sent back and I was like, ah, fuck. Um, okay, so we had theories here. And the theory was like, maybe Shay dies. Something happens to Shay in ch- childbirth, you know, bef- after that point. And Marta is like a child, okay? And she does not have many options in the galaxy. She's, I mean, she's got her gaze electric. And that seems like a big ship. To be really honest with you, it seems like a very large place. I don't know if it is, but it seems like it is. <sighs> What is she, what is she going to do? Shay's Shay's lover is dead, you know, from the veil. Things fail for nothing. Um Shay something's happened to Shay, I'm assuming. Do the Santecas take in Mari? And then does Marta come and take Mari back? Okay. Why do we feel the need to keep Mari or Santeca alive for so long? Because she keeps the paths. How does she get the paths? Oh, it's because she was what conceived on, you know, or, you know, like uh, ex- born of existence wait, wait, in the veil. Because technically the baby was, if she was with child and went to the veil and yeah. you remember Marie Santeca gives Vernestra the paths to a yeah. planet at the edge of hyperspace or yeah. at the edge of the galaxy. Yeah. It's because the baby knows where the planet X is because it was there. Brad, they have to go make a sacrifice. They have to go make a sacrifice. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Who's going to lead them there? Who's going to survive? It can't be Renestra because she's in the Acolyte. Yeah. Who who's going to who's going to give them the key to all of this? Who is going to live with a lot of guilt into her old age? Maybe she's the only one who goes and comes back because she has the knowledge of the veil. And nobody else has. Maybe Damn. she's such an important character in her older age. She's like, what, 150 at this point. Maybe she has eternal life because she's gone to the veil. Maybe not like eternal life, but you know what I'm getting at. Maybe she's able to live as long as she does because Mari was also able to live as long as she does, even though Mari living as long as she did was sick and twisted and bad. But like, I don't know, guys. I wait, have a lot like, of questions. Wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait Uh-oh. a second. You know, we, weren't we talking about like the ages of people and like who could live all the way to here but mari santeca if this is mari santeca mari santeca is definitely older than we should than we are we know her to be guys i also know she know that. no she's a hundred she's 120 years old uh or 150 years old in phase one well 120 years old is a lot different that's a 30 year difference in 150 well i she's around there she, i we did the math at one point and we basically came to the conclusion that she was born at the start of or in phase two essentially okay we, we did at some point i need you to know that i have my dino image picket that is larger than the size of my head and i've been waving it around while i've been <laughs> doing this while i'm standing here because I, I just have a lot of feelings about this but yeah we weren't sure because like we were like well we know mari is a uh, Santeca. But like Shay is not, so how does it make sense? Right. But it's like it's like so specific to to make this a point in the book to say the name of what what the kid will be if it's a girl. Like it's so intentional that it yeah. has to be that child, right? Like it There's doesn't n- make sense to just be like, oh, here's another character that is also the same name of another character, Santeca, that's a, very critical to the row family. By the way, I'm talking to Marta Row. Like it has to be, it has to right. be right. And they're right? not going to end your book on that. Like the, that's not an important detail if it's not an important detail. Right. You know? So I, I, I agree with your, your thinking though. I, I, I feel like it was like a Santeca adoption and then maybe Martyr was like, no, I'm taking that kid back. And from the Santeca's point of view, it's like, oh, the Rose and the Nile stole our child. But really it's like a reclaiming of a child that belonged to the path of the open hand technically. Yeah. 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 Anyway, <laughs> we'll find out. Time will tell in phase three of the High Republic. Yep. Which is, uh, again, 127 days away from the time of this recording. And I can't freaking wait, Sarah. I'm so, I'm so hyped. I'm so hyped for phase three. Like, I, I want the books now. I, I am really excited for it, too. I think that 
it's been so long since we've been with these characters. I, I feel, I feel ready to get back to them. I think I've been ready to get back to them this whole time because I just love them so much, but like now's the time we've had enough distance apart. And I'm, I, I feel like emotionally settled enough to be able to like journey on with them, you know? Absolutely. Well, as we mentioned up front, we have tales of light and life coming very soon. So we're covering yeah. that on the podcast. I guess we uh, are. We'll have uh, Rise of the, the Red schedule? Blade. <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh, okay. Uh, Rise of the Red, Rise of the Red Blade, Fak Pa, Return of the Jedi. We got like three more books in between now and and Eye of Darkness. So if you're a book reader like us and and love this discussion, stick around because we got tons more coming in the near future, and we're going to talk with a lot of different authors. We hope yes. Please come on the pod uh, and share their Star Wars stories. So um, that's what we love doing. We love talking about mm-hmm. books, and we love talking with the folks that make the books happen so uh thank you to everybody for listening to this episode and we hope you enjoyed all the egg talk i feel like half of this episode was truly egg talk and leveler talk and planet x talk and fear and trials of the jedi but that's the fun of the high republic is like finally piecing all these things together and like path of vengeance truly was that final piece of the puzzle that we needed to like put it all together and make it make it make sense for that Mm -hmm. perfect recipe uh, of star wars goodness yeah, but you can follow us on uh, Twitter, Instagram. We are on Threads, uh, YouTube. Sarah and I are on Letterboxd and Goodreads, uh, still on Twitter as well. Uh, make sure you're following the podcast wherever you listen and drop a five star review if you could. Helps other folks find the show and uh, always makes us feel really nice about ourselves because we get some really kind reviews. It's true. Um, we had one recently uh, from a listener that mentioned hashtag egg talk in the review. Your 20 bucks are in the mail. Good yeah. f- listener of the friends of the force. Just kidding. I don't have any money. If you want to drop a hashtag egg talk in your review, that is also appreciated. <laughs> we will have a really good laugh about it in a really like, wow, you're our bestie sort of way. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. It was so cool. Um, listener, thank you so much. We really appreciated that one. Um, seriously, but you can also find us on Patreon. We have tiers starting just at a dollar and, um, at our two dollar tiers where we talk about comics and i have read all issues of the cabin comic so we will be talking about that very soon and the one shot after that perhaps i'll let you balance precedent to just a little bit over there and we're super super grateful to all of our patrons who really help to keep the lights on so to speak at our show so thank you to ben brian cheryl clay deborah dylan Cecil, emma huang jennifer katie knights of friend leanne levi lucy Lindsay, matthew rob saber bouquet santa sky talker steven tom and travis we are very grateful for you and to you, the listener who has decided to listen through the outro. Thank you so much. I know how tedious outros can get, um, but thank you for spending a couple hours with us as we talked about Path of Vengeance. We hope that you enjoyed this book just as much as we did in our conversation. And thanks for being a part of our conversation. We're very grateful. So please uh, say hi to us at the end, on the internet because we'd love to hear your thoughts on the book as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you all once again for listening. And until next time, may the force be with you always. Shri Kai Rai Kai Rai Bye! <laughs>